Using the wrong tools can cause more harm than good. Same applies to business. Ask yourself, what does your business really need? Not sure? Visit www.smeconnect.freshbanknigeria.com to find out and get the best solutions for your business. First, First Bank. Brother Chumbul, why you they fumble? You no need to they suffer to send money. Car up or make you down the number. Star 894 hash to get started. You first, first, first. In 1894, our first branch opened in Lagos, Nigeria. And we took our place in this new land, brimming with possibilities and surprises. Take Kano, for instance, where the city's wealthiest trader made his first deposit. 20 bags of silver arriving on Camelback. Aren't you glad that we offer online banking today? Expanding across the West African sub-region and beyond, our early presence made it possible for all hard-working Africans to build great things. So is it any wonder that not one, but two first bankers have gone on to become Nigeria's central banker? We are intricately woven into the fabric of society, supporting Polo for over 100 years and pushing the limits of athletic performance. Rooted in tradition, but constantly leaning forward into the future. Are you coming? You first, first bang. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Shopping can be so much fun. Scanning through well-known brands and clicking on the payment button is so fulfilling. Thinking of places to rock them, the island or on a boat cruise. Traveling round the world, visiting exotic places with no cash worries or border issues. The First Bank Naira credit card is accepted in over 29 million locations and can be used in over 1.8 million ATMs in over 200 countries worldwide. The First Bank Naira credit card is denominated in Naira with a maximum credit limit of 3 million Naira. It's got flexible repayment options, interest-free period of up to 45 days and highly secured with verified by Visa VBV. The card can be obtained at any First Bank branch and used for international and local payments. So, don't let cash hinder your lifestyle. Get the First Bank Naira credit card today. You first. 
First Bank. Technology has changed the way we communicate. Imagine if you could chat with your bank on the go and enjoy round-the-clock services every day. Making your banking experience much more exciting, safe and convenient is exactly what First Bank WhatsApp Chat Banking is designed to do. Meet Alex. Whether it's 12 midnight or 5 a.m., he can make inquiries, transfer funds, buy airtime and data, pay bills, check account balance, and enjoy other banking services. From the comfort of his home, office, on a bus, in a taxi, while shopping, no matter where he is, as long as his WhatsApp number is the same as the registered phone number on his first bank account, banking is now truly at his fingertips. Be like Alex. Sign up to First Bank Chat Banking on WhatsApp today by adding First Bank on 0812 444 to your contact list. Get on WhatsApp and say hi. Welcome to a world of possibilities. Add First Bank on 0812 444 to begin chat banking today. You first. First Bank. Using the wrong tools can cost more harm than good. Same applies to business. Ask yourself, what does your business really need? Not sure? Visit www.smeconnect.freshbanknigeria.com to find out and get the best solutions for your business. First, First Bank. Brother Chumbul, why you they fumble? If you not need to, they suffer to send money, oh. Careful, make you down the number. Star 894 hash to get started. You first, first man. In 1894, our first branch opened in Lagos, Nigeria. And we took our place in this new land brimming with possibilities and surprises. Take Kano, for instance, where the city's wealthiest trader made his first deposit. 20 bags of silver arriving on Camel Bank. Aren't you glad that we offer online banking today? Expanding across the West African subregion and beyond, our early presence made it possible for all hardworking Africans to build great things. So is it any wonder that not one, but two first bankers have gone on to become Nigeria's central banker? We are intricately woven into the fabric of society, supporting Polo for over 100 years and pushing the limits of athletic performance. Rooted in tradition, but constantly leaning forward into the future. Are you coming? You first, first bang.
Right. Thank you so very much for those uh, montages, uh, First Bank. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Am I audible? I need a response to continue, please. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and all protocols duly observed. My name is Dr. Morris Atoki. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the African Business Coalition for Health. And I will humbly be your anchor for this webinar titled Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar hosted by the United Nations Women and the First Bank Group. Uh, thank you uh, to the First Bank team. Thank you, Ismail, uh, for having me. The importance of this collaborative webinar stresses empowering women as vital for societal advancement, emphasizing investment in education, in health, and in economic opportunities as catalysts for progress in areas that surpasses our economic growth and gender equality. Invest in women accelerate progress and the importance of this webinar on women empowerment is in alignment with the 2024 theme, Count Our In, Accelerating Gender Equality Through Economic Empowerment. UN Women's role is underscored by its engagement in initiatives that amplify the important role of women in advancing inclusive and sustainable socioeconomic development, driving women empowerment, promoting gender inclusion, according to SDG 5, and decent work according to SDG 8 for women both at the country and organizational levels. Today, we make bold to vocalize First Bank commitments to women empowerment with products such as First Gem for Women Entrepreneurs, which for those of us who don't know yet, is a single digit loan for women business and also the establishment of First Women Network, known as FWN. Today, the webinar that we've all attended is really about exploring gender lens investment. It's about education of the girl, child, and women, oh, yeah, and sustainability, and ultimately urgent action for women's economic empowerment. The webinar also seeks to call for building a care society that amplifies women's voices and addresses their practical and strategic needs for economic empowerment. But before we proceed into the webinar proper, let me re-emphasize some highlights around the key objectives of the webinar. Essentially, we are here to provide context and conceptual clarity on women's economic empowerment in Nigeria, as well as explore the importance of investing in women, both as a fundamental human rights issue and as a sustainable socioeconomic development priority. We're also here to explore innovative gender lens investments and gender themed financial instruments that advance sustainable investment for gender equality. We are here to deepen participants' understanding of the principles of promoting education, training, professional development, enterprise development, supply chain inclusion, and marketing practices that empower women as outlined in the Women's Empowerment Principles, uh, WEPs. We're here to further enlighten participants on the importance of the just and inclusive sustainability transition, leaving no one behind as it relates to building a care society that amplifies women voices. And lastly, we're here to beckon on one another to call for more action that will address both practical and strategic needs of women economic empowerment. Thankfully, some news came in early today or late yesterday night about another woman in the helm of affairs in the banking and financial services industry. We salute um, that, uh, that step. I thank you all for your attention. Uh, please join me in extending a well welcome to no other person but Mr. Ismail Omamagwe. He will be giving us the welcome address. Mr. Ismail Omamagwe is the head of sustainability, media, and external relations of the First Bank Group. Thank you, Mr. Ismail, for joining us today, and we eagerly anticipate your remarks. 
the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. It was, uh, that was uh, quite insightful and, and thanks for having me. Um, I welcome you all to this uh, Women Empowerment webinar, uh, which is themed Invest in Women, uh, Accelerate Growth. Um, it is particularly interesting that the webinar is holding in the month of March, uh, a month that uh, most of us know that is globally recognized for the celebration of women. Um, and it is indeed remarkable to host the distinguished speakers, uh, guests, participants, and fellow advocates. And of course, uh, we expect converts from uh, this Women Empowerment uh, webinar today. So as we celebrate the Women's Month, we recognize the remarkable contributions of women across all sectors. Uh, this month serves as a powerful reminder of the need to amplify women's voices, recognize and honor their achievements, uh, contributions, um, as well as address the challenges that, uh, that they face. Um, investing in women is actually investing in a collective future. When we empower women economically, socially, and then of course, politically, we unlock immense potential for growth, sustainable innovation, and inclusive and sustainable development. Research has shown that empowering women catalyzes sustainable socioeconomic transformation and outcomes in relation to improving families, communities, and of course, the broader society. Uh, we appreciate UN Women for the global leadership and governance role in driving gender inclusivity and women's sustainable socioeconomic empowerment, uh, which um, is in alignment with SDGs 5 and 8. Um, we thank you for your immense leadership. We actually value the partnership that we, we share. Uh, it is also instructive to note that our partnership with UN Women, you know, has been of tremendous importance as it has accelerated our leadership role in driving gender equality and women empowerment in Nigeria and Africa. At First Bank, we pride ourselves in being an equal opportunity employer and have integrated diversity and inclusion policies and awareness into our practices. Our efforts at closing the gender gap include having in place a diversity and inclusion policy, gender-based violence and harassment policies that encourage inclusion, programs and products that are designed to empower women and are tailored to remove barriers to advancement as well as change individual behavior. First Bank diversity and inclusion approach is effectively anchored on six elements, or key elements, if you like. So these elements are, uh, we look at the business rationale, uh, senior leadership support that is very fundamental, effective communi communication. Uh, you talk about employ employee engagement, accountability mechanisms, and of course, measuring progress. We know what doesn't get measured um, is problematic. Diversity and inclusion remains one of the core pillars of the First Bank Group's sustainability strategic focus areas. The two other pillars are health and education, as well as sustainable procurement, responsible lending, and climate performance. Um, being a signatory to the Women Empowerment Principles, what you would call for short webs, and the domestication of the principles within the first bank um, had further strengthened our gender equality and empowerment initiatives as it relates to employees, customers, and communities. So again, at first bank, we have continued to demonstrate our commitment to women empowerment by integrating the principles 
in our operations and activities is core to our business philosophy. Uh, the bank, that's First Bank, drives this implementation of WEBS through various initiatives and programs and aimed at promoting gender equality in the workplace. And of course, the broader society, supporting women entrepreneurs and advancing women's sustainable socioeconomic participation. We hope that this webinar will be able to provide context and, and some sort of conceptual clarity to women economic empowerment in Nigeria. And of course, explore the importance of investing in women, both as a human rights issue and a sustainable economic development priority. Thank you for being part of this webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Momagbe, for your very kind welcome address. We feel a bit more comfortable that we have a man um, welcoming all of us. Uh, it just really also shows inclusion. We truly appreciate uh, your scheduling to be part of this very critical uh, topic of development and inclusion. So once again, on behalf of all of the participants and the panelists and the special guests, I do uh, appreciate you. Happily, the stage is set now. Um, we have five sessions altogether, but before then, we'll be having a keynote address to set the tone for this webinar, uh, following which will be the panel discussion to discuss on the topic, invest in women, accelerate progress, women economic empowerment in Nigeria, its challenges and innovative solutions. Um, for the keynote address, uh, I would like to introduce no other person than Ms. Mo Abudu, and I would also be reciting our profile. Mo Abudu, CEO of Ebony Life Media, has made a mark through various endeavors in the corporate world. She has been described by Forbes as Africa's most successful woman. Abudu oversees Ebony Life Media, as we all know, comprising Ebony Life Films and Ebony Life Studios, as well as Ebony Life Creative Academy, a school aimed at accelerating filmmaking skills and Ebony Life Place, Nigeria's first luxury entertainment resort. She has produced several highest grossing blockbusters, which includes 50, The Wedding Party, Your Excellency, and Ulutri. Some of Mo Abudu's recent success includes the launch of Blood Sisters, Netflix's first original Nigerian series. The show made Netflix Global 10 top 10 list with over 11 million hours viewed. And Ele Shioba, The King's Osman, an adoption of renowned playwright Professor Wally Shoyinka's play of the same title, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2022. Ebony Life Media has secured several production collaborations with international studios to include Sony AMC Networks USA, Netflix, Stars, and Liongate, BBC, Westbrook Studios, and Will Parker Production. Mo Abudu, a recent executive fellow of Harvard Business School and the Ocean Central for African and African American Research, Harvard University, has recently partnered with Idris Elba's Green Door Pictures to empower and uplift talent from Africa and its diaspora by creating new TV and film projects, nurturing rising talent, providing educational and mentoring opportunities, and creating a more inclusive and diverse media landscape. In August, she was appointed creative champion for the upcoming UK African Investment Summit by the UK government. I reckon that will be August of 2023. In February 2024, Mo Abudu made history as the guest programmer for the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, curating the groundbreaking Echoes of Africa series, the first ever showcase of African cinema at the esteemed institution. Additionally, she was honored to serve as a distinguished judge for the Forbes 30 Under 30 Selection Committee in the creative category during the same month. Please join me in welcoming the ever effervescent and green Chief Executive Officer of Ebony Life Media, who most of us grew up admiring, Ms. Mo Abudu, to deliver the keynote address for this webinar. 
Miss Mo Abudu, it's a honor for me to have you here and also recite your profile. Uh, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. There is something flashing up on my screen. Let me get rid of that. Okay, it's gone. Yes, good morning, um, beautiful ladies and handsome men. If there are a few men in our midst this morning, I know Ishmael, you're, you're there. Thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this um, this special event. I mean, this really is Women's Month. It's our month. I think it should be our month every month, but this particular month is dedicated to us. And we must make sure that we use it to the absolute fullest. Um, so today, um, I am making the keynote address and keynote addresses, you know, tend to be very sort of formal and sort of very stiff and you sort of stand up and you're sort of, you know, making these speeches. Um, and typically, you know, my keynote should, I mean, I, I thought about what, how do I want to deliver this keynote today? I thought, okay, should I go macroeconomics and data and, you know, telling us about what the numbers are? We all know that. We all know how terrible the numbers are. We all know that women aren't treated fairly. We all know that there's disparity when it comes to pay. We know there's disparity when it comes to promotion within organizations. We all know that. But the thing is that what do we need to do about them, right? So I felt that let me speak about what I have been able to, I mean, I am real. I'm as real as it gets, right? I mean, let me speak about how I have been able to achieve some of the things I have been able to do. And I think it's important sometimes to bring things down to a level whereby people can tap in and fully understand that, okay, if Mo has been able to achieve this by doing this, maybe I can try some of those principles because at the end of the day, it's the results that count. It's about what do we, what do we need to do to be able to achieve the results that we want to be able to achieve. Now based on success is relative. I'm by nowhere where I wanna be. I keep reinventing, I keep re-innovating. I keep saying, I keep rebranding who I am from time to time. But let me just share with you where I am and some of the things that have worked for me. Now, my principles are very simple. Let's, you know, there's, it's, 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 it, it, there are no hard and fast rules about, I'm gonna sort of start sharing with you things you don't know. But the thing is that the things that we sometimes know, do we really, really practice those things? Are we consistent in ensuring that we see those things through? Now, I'm not trying to get religious on anyone, but I, if, if I'm going to talk about the things that work for me, I'm going to say, first and foremost, I put God first. Now, you may decide that for you, that doesn't work, or you may decide that there is some other form of something from the universe that you would rather worship. But as far as I'm concerned, I put God first. I'm a Christian. Anything that I do, I put it out there and I say, Father, Lord God, help me bless this. Show me what direction do you want me to go in? And I feel that that helps me. It centers me as I wake up every single day. And it helps me as I go back to sleep every night saying, okay, Father Lord God, thank you for today, for what I've achieved. How do I go into my tomorrow? Lead me, direct me. And I find that it helps set my pace, it centers me. So maybe find something that helps to center you. I think it's very important to set clear goals. Let's get into the, the strategy of, of business, the strategy of empowerment, the strategy of achieving, the strategy of wanting to build. It must accompany set goals. What are the goals that you wanna set for yourself? And I find at times that as women, we limit ourselves to the goals that we set. You know, why have, as I say, the corner shop when you can have the entire department store? Set your goals. If your goals and your dreams don't scare you, then you haven't really started at all. Let, you know, set really big goals, things that dream big, think big. I say, if you can think it, you can do it. Think about you know, creating whatever it is that you want to create in this world. There's nothing stopping you from owning the space. There's nothing stopping you. Dreams are free. They are in, they're right here in our heads. Think them. And then the next thing is, how do I begin to actualize them? It's really important to make daily actions. It's important to make a consistent list of things that you want to be able to achieve 
What are those things that you see in the world? Now, I often see challenges as opportunities. Yes, that sounds, it may sound crazy to some of you. I see obstacles as opportunities because it means that there's a solution that's waiting for that particular thing to be fixed, to be rearranged. And you could be the rearranger of that particular thing. If I look at my life, for example, I worked in oil and gas for many years of head of HR. Then I woke up one fine day and said, you know what, I want to set up my own HR consulting practice. And within a few years of doing that, I decided that I wanted to go further and get into the world of media because I saw that there was a challenge in that we were leaving our storytelling to people outside of us. I mean, who can tell our stories better than me, the author of my story? And that is the story of our continent. That's the story of our nation. So it's about looking at the challenges around us, embracing those challenges and saying, how do I turn this challenge into an opportunity? And these things don't happen overnight. These things can take years and years. It took me three or four years to get Moments with More off the ground. It took another four years to get Ebony Life TV off the ground. But you find that once you get going, and I also have this principle about keeping your funnel full. You know, you have to put a lot of projects out into the world. You've got to put a lot of ideas out into the world and see which ones come back. But if you have a full funnel, you're going to find that at any point in time, there are several things, there are several opportunities that are going to come from that because you have set your goals, you've established that there are obstacles, there are challenges, and you're looking to say, how can I build on the challenges that have that this particular sector or this particular area is facing. And you're taking that and you're building on it and you're listing your action points of what is it that you need to do. So if I take, for example, Moments with Mo, when I started my journey with Moments with Mo, I had never ever in my life done a talk show before. So the very first thing I said to myself was, I need to be able to watch who is considered the best talk show hostess in the world. And back in the day, this was 2004, 2003, I got the Oprah Winfrey box set of 25. She had just turned 25. So I got the box set and I sat. And in those days, it was DVD. And I watched and I watched and I watched how she interviewed. I watched her interviewing style, her techniques and all of that. And then I said to myself, OK, what else do I need to do? I need myself to train. I need to educate myself. So I went on a course in London and I learned a I went on, a, it was a very, it was a five, six day course on how to be a television presenter. I did that course, I put it away somewhere. Then I came back to Nigeria. And because I own and run a HR um, consulting firm, I said to one of my facilitators, can we please, you know, at the weekend, do some back and forth on me being interviewed by you. Let's record it. Let's play it back and let's see how that goes. And I did that for months and months and months. And then I packaged a beautiful presentation. It's important to have your documentation ready. And I took it to multi-choice DSTV. And I said to DSTV, I would really like to, you know, to create a talk show. I've never done it before, but I've done, I've done my course. Um, these are some samples that I've recorded. Um, you know, please, this is the vision I have for the show. I want to be able to showcase amazing Africans doing wonderful things, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And they said to me, wow, this is amazing. But however, you know, we can't fund it. You have to go back and go and find a sponsor. So they had given me an opportunity, but they weren't ready to finance it. So I had to go back out there and build another presentation, this time to sponsors. And when you're speaking to sponsors, it's about them finding value. What is the value for them in what you are presenting to them? What's in it for me is what it's called. And I therefore had to identify as many opportunities for the sponsors as possible. Back in the day, MTN had first, it was MTN was in Nigeria, you know, they were looking for things to do, how to become visible and all of that. So I went into MTN and I made a presentation to MTN and MTN became the first sponsors of Moments with More. I think I used to have a little yellow cushion on the show to so, sell you know, MTN colors. They would come and be guests and talk about some of their products. They would take up advertising space on the show. You had to, I had to package a whole list of benefits for them. And then the show started. And then I had to find a facility. Where am I going to shoot the show? There were no studios in Nigeria. I had to build a studio. So there was a long list. 
And whatever business it is that you are in, you're going to have to identify and make your long list of the things that you need to do to be able to achieve what it is that you want to be able to achieve. Um, time. Another simple tip of mine is time. Time is really precious, guys. And I find at times that we don't spend our time doing the right things. It's really important to allocate time to the different things that we want to be able to achieve. You may be able to say to yourself, listen, I'm going to give this thing three hours. I'm going to give this thing two weeks. I'm going to give this thing five months or six months or whatever it may be. But try to allocate time and use your time wisely. Surround yourself with positive energy and people that inspire you. You know, the team, I can't go on and on enough about how important it is to build the right team of people around you. You can own the vision, but also be ready to share that vision and let those around you be a part of this extra vision that you're creating for whatever it is that you're trying to do. I like to surround myself with a lot of young people because I find that we're living in an age now whereby I turned 60 this year. People like me, you know, we come from a different age and a different understanding of the world. And I really want to be in with the Gen Z, you know, gang. And I really want to understand what makes them tick and, and using technology and, and using all the things, innovation of today. And some of those guys have such a better understanding of those things than we do. So ensure that as you build your team, yes, I take advice from my mother. My mother is not, um, she, she doesn't understand my business, but I also find that she has nuggets of wisdom that she can help me with. So I find I'm taking advice from my mom, I'm taking advice from my children, I'm taking advice from my team, which includes all manner of people and of different age groups and all of that. It's really important to ensure that you, you're able to, you know, to, to, to build your team and have people in the team that share your vision and that can also grow your vision and ensure that you have positive energy around you. I love having lots of people around me that feed, in, feed into what I'm doing and they give me positive vibes. And you can tell, you know, one thing that we women have that we often don't use a lot of is our gut instinct. Women are blessed. I have to say this more than men are with gut instinct. And I think we need to learn how to use this gut instinct more and more. If your gut is saying something to you, buy into that. If it's saying to you that it thinks that this is a really great idea, buy into it. If it's saying to you, mm, it's not so, maybe move on. Because I really do strongly believe in my gut and I, my, I trust my gut a lot. So when I have people around me, instinctively, I'm careful about the energies that are around me. And I like to keep Especially if I'm launching a new project or a new product, I like to keep people around me that give me that positive energy. And I move away from people that give me negative energy because they do exist. And I want to suggest that, you know, you spend less and less time with such people in, in, in your lives. It's important to stay focused. I find that there are so many distractions especially in Lagos, there's so much going on all the time. And, you know, I, I don't wanna say be obsessive, but I find that one of my principles is that when I'm dealing with something really important and there's an important project that I'm working on, I get a bit obsessive about it and I have to shut out the noise to be able to focus on ensuring that I can achieve that particular objective. Um, I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And I think it's important to embrace the mistakes that we make and use them to build for the future. It's part of the learning process. I, I really believe that mistakes help me learn. They help me get better at what it is I've done. And I'm going to keep making mistakes. I just hope and pray that I don't make the same mistakes twice. So when you do make mistakes, I find sometimes as women, we beat ourselves up. Oh my God, why did that happen? It happened, it happened. You know what? Move on, use it so that going forward, you're, you're able to do, to, to do much better. You know, um, it's important for us as women to be persistent. Um, at times, you know, and don't give up thinking that I can't achieve this thing because it hasn't worked. I don't think there's anything that I've done in my life that hasn't taken me three, four, five years until it becomes a reality. And what people often see is the end product. They don't know what has happened behind to get you to this point of whereby you're walking the red carpet or you're making an announcement or this particular project has launched, you know? So it's, I, I think, you know, don't, don't, don't ever get to a point of whereby you feel like 
I'm going to give up on this thing, you know, until you're absolutely certain in your mind that you've given it 100%. I also believe strongly, I would say in, in a principle called the law of averages. The law of averages basically means that everyone in the world can't say no to you. So every time you get a no, you move on, you learn from it. I say that there are two types of people that you're going to meet in your life. You're going to meet your dream makers and you're going to meet your dream killers. And they are both as important as each other. Because what dream killers tend to do is that they tend to try to kill the dream. But in killing the dream, they're also putting out things and sharing with you on why they believe the project that you've told them about isn't going to be successful. What you need to do, I do, is I take all of that on board and I say, thank you very much. And I go back to my notepad. I have, I believe, I mean, I love to write. I mean, my scribbles, my scribbles, you know because it helps me think. And then at some point later, I'm going to put it back on my laptop, you know? So take whatever your dream killers are telling you, go back to the drawing board and reinvent. And then you meet your dream makers. And more often than not, your dream makers are going to be people that you don't know that well. These, I've, I've found the weakest links in my life to be the people that have helped me achieve the most success. I think sometimes as women, we're looking for maybe that sense of comfort, let me stay in my comfort zone and let me just reach out to the people that I know within my circle that are going to help me achieve my dreams. And sometimes you find that they're the least people that are going to help you achieve your dreams. In most instances, for me, I have found that it has been absolute strangers or people that I have hardly a relationship with that have truly stepped in to help me achieve my dreams. So get out of your comfort zone. When I set up Ebony Life Television, we had to move to Calabar. I mean, I'd, I mean, I've only ever lived in Nigeria. I've only ever lived in a place called Lagos. And then to now say to myself, I'm leaving Lagos to go to Calabar. But I did. And it was it, the most, we had the most awesome time there. Governor Luli Moke welcomed us with his wife, Obioma. We set up Ebony Life TV there. We're there for three years. I had to move out of my comfort zone to be able to realize the dream of Ebony Life TV becoming a reality. So we're not, we can't sometimes sit still thinking that if I stay here, um, these things are going to work out for me. You, you may have to not, it may not, it may not work out that way. You may have to move out of that comfort zone. And if you're not ready to move out, then maybe you're not ready to achieve the dream. Now, one thing that men do that we don't do enough of is that we never advocate for ourselves. I mean, men all the time. I did this. I have achieved that. I've done that. And women, I find at times we never sing our own praises. We never talk about how wonderful we are. No one is going to help you brand you. You have to be your own brand ambassador. You've got to go out there and build yourself to be able to achieve what it is that you want to achieve. Networking and going out. You can't stay home trying to achieve these dreams. Now, the reason why I want to say Ebony Life TV and Ebony Life Media has achieved a lot of the success that it has achieved is because I have been traveling the, the globe for the last 10 years, going to all the major events around the sector that I'm in. And when I first got there, I didn't know anybody. I'm simply walking around, introducing myself and giving everybody my card. And it took four or five years before anyone took me seriously. But by the time they've seen you at the fifth time at this annual conference for TV in Cannes or whatever it is in America, they're going to know, okay, this woman is persistent. And when there's an opportunity now, they're going to call on you because you are all they see and you are all they happen to know and who they happen to trust. So it's so important for us to get out of our comfort zones and move out into that world and network and meet people we don't know and make polite conversation because really and truly that's the only way you're going to get to know them. Cultivate a sense of confidence. Com confidence is so important that we must, we must know within us that we can achieve this. And last but not least, never give up. Never give up. Please just keep going, knowing that once you've set your goals, once you've got your daily tasks, you've got your team, you can do it. And as I often say, if you can think it, you can do it. And that is my keynote for today. I've kept it as simple as possible um, because I really wanted it to be practical, things that you can take away um, that have worked for me, that can hopefully help you know, us as a community of women to be able to achieve the things we want to be able to achieve. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much. Um, Madam Mo Abudu, I mean, we didn't expect less. I I, I love all of the uh, nuggets and the uh, words that you have shared from putting God first to having your funnel full to ensuring that you're focused, um, move away from your comfort zone and so on and so forth. Thank you so much. I'm certain 
uh, the participants are buzzing with excitement and they have questions for you already. So um, you have another four minutes to take some questions. Uh, do we have questions on the chat or in the question area? Let's say we have three questions. Um, so there's one from Anyahu Marilinda, and she's asking, what are the strategies for promoting women's economic empowerment in Nigeria? What is the role of government and organization in supporting women and success stories of women who have achieved economic empowerment? I think that's a bit generic. If you're comfortable yeah. to, to answer it, yeah, it's uh, cool. But, uh... I mean, he's, he's asking about what role does government play? Um, yeah. And organizations. And what organizations are going to be about you putting yourself out there, really and truly? I mean, mm. first, I have an organization that has supported me in, 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 in a number of the projects that I have done, but I have had to put myself out there and I've had to sort of ensure that whatever I say to them or offer them is as competitive as what the next mm. person or the next man is offering them. You know, I, I don't think, I, I have no sense of entitlement of being the one that should achieve anything. I know that whatever it is that I want, I've got to put myself out there to be able to achieve it. I've got to think about what is that gap? What is that challenge? What is that opportunity that I'm trying to fill? And then I go out and I prepare my paperwork. I, I mean, paperwork and I, I'm, I mean, without my laptop, I'm dead, literally. So it's about me being able to visual, they need to visualize what it is mm. that I am able to offer them. So for me to be empowered, no one's going to empower me unless I have some value that I'm adding onto them. You don't you can't be empowered for the sake of, of being empowered. So what is that? my question is, what is it that this person does that she wants to be empowered to? So that would depend on where, what organization or what government institution you go to. You've got to have something to offer. You've got to have something to offer, yeah. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another one says that she's intrigued. Her name is Egoho Sarah Ifidon. Yeah. She's intrigued by your remarkable journey and accomplishments. She's particularly interested in learning more about your investments in women over the years and how that can be replicated. Um, could you please share insights in your strategies and initiatives for empowering women? I mean, for me, um, in our organization, for example, nine out of 10 of our executives are women, right? My head of human resources right. is a woman. Our head of programming is a woman. We have, oh, three wow. lawyers. we have three lawyers in the company, they're all women. Our senior producers are women. I mean, you know- I hope I we're applauding and to more for this. I head of <laughs> So I'm just saying that that is my own strategy is to make sure that within my own organization, I put women at the forefront of what we do because I really believe that women, not only do we nurture, we also go the extra mile when it comes to putting what we need to put into getting done done within our organization. I'm not saying I don't have men in our organization. We do. And I have a brilliant men that work with us. But to say we have more women than we have men. And I think every woman should, if every woman did that, the numbers would be, would be better. Every woman running an organization, if you decided to, to be intentional about hiring women, the numbers would be different to what the numbers are today. Right, absolutely. So be deliberate about it. Yeah. Thankfully, yeah. Um, the next question, yeah, I think you've covered it, but again, maybe be a bit more specific. How do you connect with like-minded people? How do I connect? Yes, how do you network? Oh, how do I like connect? I said, I, your... I, I mean, I, I, I love talking about the work that I do. So I find that I'm, I am I belong to various groups and bodies. I'm a member of the Oscars. I'm a member of the Emmys. I go to all these various events around the world where I meet people that are in my business, hospitality events, because don't forget, we also do hospitality as well with Ebony Life Place. And then there's the media side of the business. So it's about making sure that I am in those ecosystems, whatever it is that you love, you have to bury yourself within those ecosystems and those communities, you know, and the events that they have and, you know, the conferences and, and the parties and all of that. As I said, you've got a network. I mean, there's no point in me networking, I mean, with people that aren't involved in my work, unless it's a social event and it's a party and it's a friend's event or whatever. But outside of that, a lot of my work is based around networking within this community of 
of the work that I do because we love talking about what's the next project, you know, what's your next movie and who's your director and who's your producer and who's doing continuity. And this is sometimes language that only we understand because we are in that business, you know? Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've done a lot of excellent work. So I guess it's even easier to talk about successes, you know, um, because you've, 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 you've made your mark in the industry. So congratulations on that. Um, the last question, again, because of time, and by the way, you have over 20 questions here, um, wow. I, but I don't think that we can cover all of them. Um, it's the one that particularly has to do with your industry. I'm, I'm selecting uh, this one particularly because I, I think it would be nice for us to hear. How challenging can a media world be to a woman um, from your experience? Yeah, I, but the great thing, and it's a bit of an anomaly, but in Nigeria, we've got great women at, you know, doing this work in Nigeria. I mean, we had an event with Netflix um, on International Women's Day um, earlier, a couple of weeks ago. And it was wonderful to see all the women in the room that are doing incredible things. I mean, if you look today to say the highest grossing film in Nigeria was made by Fumpi Akindele. We have directors like Kemi Aditiba, like Jadi, or Shiberu, you know, we have Chioma Ude that runs the Africa International Film Festival. I'm just saying that there are women, I mean, there's Moabudu that's running Ebony Life Group, you know, hospitality and entertainment. And we've got all our senior people that work with me in the organization. You know, so I'm saying we've got Balani Austin Peters that runs Terra Culture. And also she makes, she's a film producer and a film director. Hello, women are leading in this sector in Nigeria today. We are leading and it's because Yes, we. I say as a black woman, as an African woman, we've got to work three, four times harder than anyone else. But that also yeah. prepares, it prepares us, you see. The hard work prepares us, knowing that when we go out there, we hit the ground running and we're able to achieve the success that we have because we are prepared and we've put in the work. Absolutely. So in Nigeria, women are leading. We can't say we aren't in that particular sector. We can't say the same for every other sector, of course. But when it comes to the, the world of film and television and media, women are playing a very significant role today. And it is something that I'm really proud about. So yeah, it's it's a case study. It's a it case study. Be. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, ma'am. Thank you so very much uh, for those very excellent uh, uh, comments and answers to the questions asked. Unfortunately, we can't take all of the questions today. I'm sure uh, First Bank and UN Women will find a way of uh, maybe chatting following this webinar with you to address Absolutely. more of the questions. But Absolutely. indeed, we are really elated. We are um, honored uh, that you graced this occasion with the keynote address. We didn't expect um, anything less from you. And we're very thankful um, that you. you have given us very and, and as you know, First Bank has <laughs> First Bank has the amazing Falake Animumani there, a head of corporate. Oh, yes, absolutely. She's, she's, she's another one. And she's, awesome. she's absolutely awesome about everything. She's intentional about what she does. She's awesome. She empowers women. Um. So, yeah, so First Bank, thank you for the opportunity and for letting me once again, you know, share my story. And to you and women, thank you. Thank you, Mom. Thank right. you. Bye for now. Thank Bye you. for now. So very quickly, everyone, um, having enjoyed that welcome address, we're now going to move to the lead address, and it is my pleasure to introduce the lead speaker, Ms. Beatrice Ayong. She's the UN Women Country Representative of Nigerian ECOWAS, and I also had the pleasure to read out her profile. Ms. Beatrice Ayong currently works as the UN Women Country Representative for UN Women in Nigeria and the Economic Community of West African State, ECOWAS, leading initiatives aimed at dismantling barriers and championing the rights of women in Nigeria and in the ECOWAS region. Prior to this, her tenure as resident representative in Mali saw her negative complex challenges to expand UN women's footprints, making significant strides in advancing gender equality and women's empowerment. A journey also led to led her to Niger, where she spearheaded efforts to revitalize UN women's presence, earning back donor trust and government respect through tangible results and strategic partnerships. She was also responsible for establishing and managing the UN Women Office in Eastern uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where she confronted the daunting task of addressing gender 
disparities in conflict areas. Beyond institutional roles, her engagement with political and state institutions demonstrate her belief in the power of advocacy and legislative reform. Collaborating with parliament, parliamentarians across multiple countries, she advocated for gender responsive policies and fostered alliances to elevate women's voices in decision-making processes. Working and fostered alliances, working with diverse political parties in Eastern DRC, she championed women's leadership and strives to embed gender equality in political agendas. Our educational background includes a master in science in agricultural extension from the University of Reading, United Kingdom, and diplomas from esteemed institutions in the Netherlands and in Cameroon. This academic journey on her expertise in gender analysis, media production and for extension and training, microfinance for rural development, and the management of extension staff, providing a robust framework for uh, professional endeavors. Throughout her career, Ms. Beatrice Ayo has remained guided by a vision of a world where gender equality is not just an aspiration, but a reality as she continues on this path She's inspired by the countless lives touched and the transformative power of collective action in shaping a brighter future for generations to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Miss Beatrice Young. Madam Beatrice, the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank, thank you uh, very much for such a <laughs> uh, introduction. Uh, I want to start by uh, uh, thanking First Bank for accepting to uh, jointly organize this uh, webinar. I really see the power of the webinar. We have 850 uh, uh, persons connected. So Dr. Adesola Ade Don. I hope I called the name fine, the CEO, C the Chief Executive Officer of uh, first, uh, first Bank. Uh, my dear sister who just spoke, uh, in fact, I was taking down notes when she was talking, uh, Madam Mo Abudu. And distinguished ladies and gentlemen, allow me to stand on uh, the, the existing protocol. As I first said, I sincerely thank uh, the First Bank uh, First Bank colleagues and UN Women colleagues who have jointly put this uh, webinar together. It's always a pleasure to work with First Bank. Uh, each time we talk with them, meet with them, we see that they have put gender equality and women's empowerment in the core of what they do, the business they do, at the uh, internal uh, uh, part of the bank itself and also outside the bank. I would not like to finish without uh, thanking Madam Amina Ayagbola of Wiska, who is a, a very good partner and who is also a panelist. I want to also appreciate all the panelists who are here to make sure this webinar is uh, a, a success. I've been asked to talk on uh, women, investing in women, accelerating growth in organizations and economies global perspectives and required action. The first thing I would like to say, the order of my presentation, what I will be saying is looking at uh, the types of investment. We must first of all uh, talk about the, first, uh, the, the, the types of investment. We're also looking at why did the uh, UN, why did the United Nations, especially uh, UN women, why did they choose uh, this theme this year about investment, investing in women and girls, and how is it related to accelerating uh, uh, development? We're also going to, I'll be talking about what are the issues in investing in women? What are the issues, the problems, and what are the benefits? I'll also go down to talk a little bit about uh, required action, and then I'll conclude. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm so happy uh, that uh, this webinar is going on. The first thing I want to be, uh, bring to the table is the type of investments. When they talk about investments, people just always think of uh, just uh, financial investments, but we have different types of investment. And there are investments that 
you do on somebody and there's a, there are investments that the person does on himself or herself. So it's not, when we are talking about investment, it's not just looking at somebody else who is investing in somebody else. It's also looking at how you personally also invest in yourself. The first uh, aspect that we have, uh, that I, I would like us to consider is the time you spend. Time, time that we may spend in, in coaching, mentoring somebody, nurturing somebody, advising somebody, that is a huge investment. Though it might not have a, a monetary value, but if we want to give it a monetary value, you'll see that it's actually very huge. And also, personally, how do you spend your time? I think my sister who said, uh, who talked before me, Madame Mo, talked about time management. So how time is a, is a resource, a perishable resource, that if you don't manage it, so what do you spend your time on? Do you, uh, you need to spend time on developing yourself, reading, going to seminars and all those things. So those are aspects of investment that women need to do on, their, on themselves and also women need to do for others. So time management, the things you spend your time to do. In fact, if you don't manage your time, by the time you're 60, you'll be regretting the time that you've passed. So that is an investment. And we are also looking at uh, equipments you know, today we are talking about uh, 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 technology, we are talking about digital solutions and all those. Those are kind of investments that we can also invest for ourselves and also invest for others within the organization. I, I insist, I'm insisting on personal investment because sometimes when it is the organization that is actually saying, okay, we're going to put our money so that you go for this seminar. It's easy. You're happy. The person is happy. But when it is that there's an important cause that you have to put your money so that you can take that cause, people shy away. See, knowledge is something we have to invest in personally. And then we can also come back to talk about our, our, our the financial investment. So there are different types of investment. It's not just limited to the issue of money. It's investment in all its sense. I'll leave it there. The other thing I want to bring on the table is why uh, did uh, the, inter uh, the, the UN and other, and other stakeholders decide to talk about investment in women? And I would even add investment in women and girls. The first thing is that it is very clear that we have a huge gender inequality, a, a, huge, a huge gender inequality in the digital space. We are entering, we are already in a digital age. And very soon, even in Nigeria, we are, we are talking about a digital economy. So there are gender gaps even inside the digital space, there's a digital divide, and you come a time when if you don't know how to, 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 to operate within this digital space, it will be a problem. For now, it is actually, uh, uh, there's a gender gap. We have about 22% uh, of uh, women working in, uh, uh, in that, uh, that space. We also, also, the issue is also the gender inequality in governance, in power, in decision making, in leadership positions. I would like to congratulate uh, First Bank, including other banks, the private sector in Nigeria, that is actually showing the way in terms of uh, uh, women, women's access uh, to decision making positions. Statistics show that at least 20% or even 22% of uh, top managerial positions are occupied by women in the, 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 the private sector and especially in the banks. This is, this is a, a very good uh, uh, event. They are, they also the issue why we, they talked about, they're talking about investment is also uh, the issue of unpaid care work, the necessity to invest in the unpaid care work. Why? Because the unpaid care work has an influence on women's participation in leadership, women's participation, in politics, women's participation, even the, in the economic sphere, in the public sphere, if uh, 
the, uh, the reproductive activities, the unpaid care work, which is uh, cooking, looking for fuel wood, taking care of the, sea, the sick, if all that takes the woman's time in such a way that she cannot leave the home economy to enter the market economy, then there is, we, we are witnessing what we are witnessing, feminization of uh, poverty. So those are some of the things that caused uh, uh, the UN and its uh, stakeholders to talk about investment. But also, uh, women are actually lagging behind, and it is affecting the efficiency and effectiveness of development until we have women, until we have an equilibrium between the sexes, that is, we have 50% uh, men, 50% women benefiting, accessing, controlling, deciding, sitting on the table. We are not going to have sustainable development. So as long as we have one sex that is lagging behind, development can no longer be sustainable. So these are the issues that pushed the UN to say we need to invest more in women. We are also witnessing a, a pushback. There is a pushback even in terms of uh, women's rights. It's, it's, it's there, it's clear, we are seeing it. Sometimes even to define who is a woman is a problem globally. When you ask who is a woman, some people may not even want to respond. These are issues, some of the rights that we have had, we, have, we, have see, see, we are seeing them being pushed back. And this also in, it, it comes into the, the funding space. The, the, the issue of, of funding. So there's, there is shrinking uh, in, in the funding for gender equality and women's empowerment. And that's why we say invest, because there's a need to increase. Uh, globally, uh, UN Women's Statistics shows that we need 360 billion US dollars annually to bring gender equality. I mean, annually. And then in Africa, the African Development Bank has said that uh, Africa will need 40 billion US dollars to bring gender equality. So there is need for huge investments, for huge investment. Another reason is we are seeing uh, uh, an increase in feminized poverty. Yeah, the poverty, especially in Africa, is, the, is, is, is showing a, a female face, is showing a woman's face. Even uh, HIV AIDS, they say, is showing a, a, a younger, a, a young girl's face. So there is feminized poverty. And by 2030, uh, 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 if we don't have, if we don't change the, the way we invest, if we don't increase the investment in gender equality and women's empowerment, we're definitely going to see 340 million women and girls go into extreme poverty. So these are the issues that, uh, made the UN and U, uh, UN women's partners to say, no, let's, let's talk about uh, uh, investment. There is need for investment. And definitely I've already stated the fact that if there is no investment in gender equality and women's empowerment, we are never going to achieve sustainable development. Out of the 17 SDGs, the uh, SDG 5 is central to the achievement of the other 16 uh, uh, SDGs. So, there is need to invest more money. So what are the issues in investing? What are the issues? What are the problems? What would be the benefit, for instance? The one thing I would say is that the financial architecture does not favor women. So the structures that we have, the loan schemes that we have, yes, First Bank may have a better one, but generally, globally, because I'm talking on global issues, Globally, this financial architecture does not, uh, it's not aligned, it's not suitable, it's not appropriate with uh, uh, women's uh, needs. For instance, when we look at the loan prefer preferences of banks or financial institutions, they are definitely uh, uh, loan preferences that are aligned to the economic uh, uh, sector to economic activities, to what we uh, especially, gender specialists would call productive activities. But when it comes to uh, reproductive activities, that take a lot of time, that takes much, much time for women, then we, 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 don't, we don't see those loan pref uh, preferences. Let me take, for instance, let me give an example. You have a young, I met a young uh, uh, candidate last year, no, 2022, who was, uh, 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 
campaigning to become senator. And she told me, UN women, young women need a, a, a different kind of support because women of your age, anyway, I turned 60 last year. So I'm 60, my children are all big. I don't have, I don't need a, a, somebody to take care of, of a baby for me and all those kind of things, you see. But this young girl, she's she's a young a young girl. So her children are small. She needs to take care of those, those children. She needs to take care of her home. And so if there is not, we don't have specific support for her, like labor saving devices, how do you expect such person to win the elections with somebody who has full time focus on his, uh, on his uh, political uh, ambitions? So uh, though we don't uh, have loan preferences and we don't consider uh, this unpaid care work, we don't consider uh, to, 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 to invest in it, but I tell you, it is affecting women's participation, even in the organizations, even in the economy, even in the political, the, it's affecting all. So these are areas that we, 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 we need to, to, to invest in invest in reproductive activities, that is invest in technologies that will reduce the time, women, uh, the time women spend on reproductive activities, taking care of the sick, so that they can have more time to invest in uh, economic uh, activities, productive activities, the political activities, governance, et cetera. And uh, another thing I, I, I want to talk about uh, uh, the issues of uh, funding, uh, investing in women is the question still remains to say that uh, are we actually investing in the right things? Yesterday we were launching the Human Development Report and we had a panel that was talking about what needs to be done for, for Nigeria to improve on uh, the uh, human development. And one of the things that came out very clearly was that we don't have the required funding and we don't, the, the funds that we have, the money that we have, we are not investing in the right things. And same for gender equality and women's empowerment. If you look at SDG 5, we have targets there that were crafted in a holistic and integrated manner that if we, if we uh, achieve those targets, then we'll be able to bring gender equality in the country. But today, when you look at those targets, you see that people are not even following the SDG 5 targets. They are not interested. They are not even looking at that. Not to talk of funding. We have uh, funding for some activities, but we don't have uh, for some targets, but for other targets, we don't have funding. Take, for instance, political participation. Take reproductive uh, 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 rights. We don't have funding. It's clear that we don't have funding. So the issue is that we don't have the, the, the funding, but the funds that we have, are we investing in the right things? These are questions that uh, we, 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 have to, we have to ask. And then I will quickly go to the required actions. The required actions. Uh, we need to invest. I, I'm just continuing. We need to invest holistically to make sure that women can be liberated from our, I think there are so many men who are connected today. They are there. African men have not yet taken the responsibility uh, to, or uh, taking the, 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 the time out to support their women, to support them so that they can have more time for themselves. So what we can do is to provide, to invest, what we can do is, uh, fund technologies that will reduce the time women spend and the labor, the pain that they spend, so that women can freely. In fact, I've seen cases that where women spend even 16 hours of their day, and even in the nights, they are still uh, uh, doing other things. So if we could put 4% of our gross domestic uh, product on childcare services, it will create 9 million jobs, I mean, in Nigeria, if we can just use only 4% uh, uh, of our GDP on child care services, we're going to create 9 million jobs, of which 60% of those jobs will be women's jobs. So this is one thing we can do. It will release women so that they are free to, to, to release their potentials. The second thing I would say is that we should actually go back to the drawing board and look at 
SDG 5 and see how we can uh, uh, fund those targets that don't have uh, funding. How do we uh, make them? Because if we, if we leave one of the targets, two of the targets, we are never going to meet gender equality. So required action, one, uh, uh, three, invest in women's personal development. You have heard uh, Auntie, Auntie Mo talk extensively. If, 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 if you listen to her, you will know that she's a woman who is fully empowered. She's, she's a woman who knows what tools to use. To use. She's a, a woman who knows what to do. What she, she knows how to get what she wants. So we need women to invest in their personal development. Women, either as personal, they themselves or other uh, uh, women organizations or economists should do that for personal development in terms of education, health, leadership. Just see our country. We have 18 million drop out of school. This should be a concern for us because the majority of those children who are drop, uh, they have dropped out. They have no, no, no skills. They have no, uh, I mean, marketable skills, they have no job, they are not literate, it's difficult for them to, 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 to actually be productive as we would want. I've met a girl 16 years, already divorced with one child. She married at the age of 13 years and she didn't have time to, to learn a marketable skill and she's out with a child that she has to take care, she doesn't have a job. That is how the perpetration of the feminization of poverty is, 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 is increasing by the day. So I think this is where we should, uh, this is where we, we can put money. In terms of health, we need to put money. In fact, I don't even need to speak much about that because uh, if you are not healthy, you can't uh, do what you are supposed to do. We also need uh, uh, women to develop leadership. Uh, uh, Beijing Plus uh, 25 uh, uh, evaluation has shown that we have concentrated the development of women's leadership only at the level of the assembly, higher, uh, higher, uh, uh, that, that's the national assembly, uh, uh, higher positions within uh, corporate, uh, uh, corporate uh, uh, milieu. But the grassroots, at the grassroots, women's leadership has not really moved. They are encouraging us to invest in promoting women's leadership, not only at the level of the national assembly, but also at the level of the grassroots so that women can also uh, contribute. There's also, uh, I've already talked about it, we need to invest in women's time use. UN Women, we are uh, uh, working with uh, the National uh, Bureau of Statistics to look at how do uh, women spend their time. The way they spend their time, does it, does it tell us whether they will come out of poverty or they will remain in poverty? So this we are looking at funding their reproductive activities, their productive activities, and why not community management? There is a debate today uh, at, 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 at HQ, at our HQ, where we are saying, should we or should we not fund women's campaign, electoral campaign? Should we fund or should we not fund? So these are issues that we, are, we, we have to look at. If we want women to be in positions, then we have to do the right fund. We have to fund. We are also saying we should invest in women's access to services, especially financial services. We need to uh, help women. And at the uh, UN Women, what, for instance, uh, the, we are working at uh, the macroeconomic level where we are convincing government to look at some of its fiscal policies. If you take like VAT, VAT is, it's, it's not a fair tax. It's not a fair tax because I'm buying the same product with a woman in a supermarket that does not earn even one tenth of what I, what I earn. So uh, it's not a fair tax. So these are things that we're advocating at that level that those policies should consider. For instance, why should they put VAT tax in, uh, to, to, to PAD? PAD is it's, it's a natural thing. Why should they? They should remove the VAT. And, so those are other things that, those are the kind of advocacies that we are making at uh, that uh, high, high, high level. So we are influencing Absolutely. macroeconomic policies at that high level. But again, as you know, we are also working with the private sector of which uh, First Bank is one of our strong uh, uh, partner. Uh, we are working on what we call women empowerment services, and I want to seize the opportunity to thank uh, First Bank because First Bank has really done 
<laughs> can save it more than we were expecting. First bank is looking at gender uh, equality in their in their uh, bank. They are looking at the gender equality in their workplace. They are looking at employee health and safety. They are looking at education and training so that uh, women can go up the, the, the decision-making ladder. In fact, they are also looking at uh, developing, uh, uh, making the enterprise and supply chain development uh, gender responsive. So, and even out of uh, First Bank, they are also looking at uh, how the, the, their financial services would be adaptable responsive to women, especially those women whom we shall not leave behind, women uh, living with HIV AIDS, women living with disabilities, women, uh, uh, widows, actually, maybe I give the statistics here, 15% of our rural, uh, uh, of, uh, of households in rural areas are headed by women. In the town, in the urban area, 19%. And if you want to calculate, take even the average, we have 40 million people, people in those households. And I want to thank First Bank and the other ones that are thinking of women, women like this. Before I end, I think uh, I will finalize by saying, let us work collectively. No institution, no government alone, no uh, private sector alone can bring about gender equality in any country. We need to put ourselves all together, ask the right questions, fund the right things, measure the right things, and work together. Thank you for listening. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Madam Beatrice, uh, for your kind lead address. I always look forward to, to hearing you and particularly hear you talk about the necessity to um, make it more convenient and comfortable for women uh, to deal with their domestic um, responsibilities so that they can have more time to engage on economic um, activities that uh, uh, better uh, aims to, to um, support national development. So I, I, I truly, truly uh, agree with you and I'm sure all of the audience um, uh, as well, I've uh, heard you, uh, and we're, we're more enlightened um, through what UN Women is currently doing in empowering women and in fostering women's socioeconomic contributions uh, to our society and beyond. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll take the next four minutes for your questions. So I'm just going to uh, look at the questions and see, all right, so. Uh, I have one that says, <laughs> how do you invest in women farmers? Um, I guess that's for the United uh, Nation women. Do you have activities that support uh, women in agriculture or women in farming? Over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to take down the question. Okay, uh, how, if I understand the question is how do we invest in uh, uh, women in agriculture? Is that the question? Yes, please. She did okay. say farming, but again, yeah, you might want to expand it to cover agriculture. Okay. The, the, the first thing, uh, we, we have what we call climate smart agriculture. That is digitally assisted. Uh, the first thing we in that uh, 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 program is first to look at access to land. We, we work in having a, a gender responsive uh, uh, land management. Because if you look at it, we, women form the majority of uh, those who provide labor in the farms for food production. But when you look at, they, they own about 10% of resources due to issues of uh, inheritance, issues of uh, not having uh, uh, money to buy because they could also buy. And uh, so we look at the access to land, but also we are also looking at access to farm inputs, the good, the correct farm inputs. We are, we are supporting in, uh, access to farm inputs, access to uh, uh, ex uh, gender responsive uh, uh, agricultural extension, because sometimes, in some areas, it's difficult for a man to go do extension service for 
for a woman in some areas, our culture and religion does not allow that. So we have to make sure that we uh, women are actually participating participating in in the extent agricultural extension services. We're also looking in terms of access to markets, access to markets, and that is why this uh, uh, climate smart agriculture has what we call uh, a digital platform. We call buy from women. Buy from Women is already in many countries. Buy from Women is a digital platform that enables rural women to access uh, climate information in real time. So, you know, there's climate change. Sometimes it's difficult now to determine when uh, the rains will fall and when they need to plant. So they have access to information concerning the climate, information concerning where they can buy good quality inputs. They have information in terms of where they can sell their, their produce. So they have digital uh, uh, warehouses where they, they expose what they, are, they have produced, what cost. So they can produce anywhere in Nigeria and sell anywhere in Nigeria. And then uh, this digital platform enables women to have uh, uh, what we call produc uh, production uh, history. So you can see the last five years, how did she produce? And we can also see uh, the last five years, her credit history from that same platform. This enables them oh. to sign contracts with, uh, with private companies that would supply, that would uh, use their farm produce as their, their raw materials. And it also helps Absolutely. women in that uh, when they sign the contracts, the, the private sector will give 20% of uh, uh, the, the, the money they are supposed to collect because we, already, we can forecast their production. So we know what they are going to produce. We know how they are going to sell. So we know the amount of money that is going to come. And also we have uh, uh, agri insurance attached to it. So in any way, the women right. are going to have their So the private enterprise gives 20%. And this 20% is very important because it's not looking at the loan preferences of banks or financial institutions. It's just giving them the 20%. This 20% can go for their reproductive activities, can go, for instance, let's be frank, when the woman comes to take a loan from somewhere, she will say, okay, I want to put in my farm. But let's take, for instance, if her child is sick, do you think she will leave her child to die because she wants to go and buy the farm inputs? So this 20% enables this woman to manage her home, manage her children until when she will have the other 80%. And uh, the Absolutely. interesting thing is that we can stay here in Abuja and train women in other states without moving from Abuja. And then the agricultural services, they are able to follow the farms with that digital platform without moving from right. where they are. So this is what we do. Uh, in uh, in uh, uh, agriculture, I would end Absolutely. because I know my time is up. And then we have the link. If you want to read about, if you want to read more about uh, uh, buy from women, you can the link. Uh, Chukwe Maker has just sent it to the chat. You can you can click Brilliant. on that and it will give you more information. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, that that's a very thought out um, response and very robust approach you have for agriculture there in the UN women. Thank you for sharing. Um, please, if you were the one who asked the question, look out for the link. I'm sure the link will be useful to a lot of participants uh, that are here today. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Madam Beatrice, for that uh, very elaborate response you provided. In the interest of time, we will not be able to take um, any more questions. Um, but again, uh, just like uh, for Antimo, there are a couple of questions uh, for you. But uh, thank you, thank you for your lead address. It was very insightful, uh, very also useful uh, to enlighten us about uh, what UN Women is currently doing in that um, space. Now we will move to the panel discussion, uh, this panel session that we've all been waiting for. Um, and joining this conversation, uh, versed subject matter experts, all of whom have demonstrated capacity in the topical areas that we'll be diving in today. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our panelists um, that have been carefully selected to discuss and share insights on investing in women, accelerating growth in organizations and economies, global perspectives and required actions uh, uh, within this discussion session. 
Well, before we uh, jump into the panel, there's something I'd like us to do collectively and commit to heart. I, I think many a time we talk about SDG 5, um, which of course, I mean, we all know to be achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, as earlier echoed by uh, the lead um, uh, address giver, Madam Beatrice. I'd like us to kind of also just go over the um, sub uh, targets of SDG 5 and in a way commit it to heart so that we know what these rights are, we know what these targets are, and we have better inclination into what the indicators are, even as you know we're charged towards um, being achievers and drivers and advocates for sustainable development goal number five. Um, in actual fact, 5.1 tells us that we must end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. 5.2 tells us to eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. 5.3 tells us to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early and forced marriage and female genital mutilation. I don't get to hear a lot of um, conversations around that and I think it's equally as important as any other topic. 5.4 tells us to recognize and value unpaid care and domestic work through the provision of public service infrastructure and social protection policies, and the promotion of shared responsibility within the household and the family as national, nationally appropriate. In 5.5, we're told to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. And the final one uh, for that particular indicator is on 5.6, which says to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights as agreed in accordance with the program of action of the International Conference of Population and Development and the Beijing Platform for Action and the outcome documents of their review conference, uh, conferences which underscores the following actions. Undertake reforms to give women an equal rights to economic resources as well as access to ownership and control over land and other forms of property, financial service, inheritance, and natural resources in accordance with national laws. 5B, um, and the second to the last, to enhance the use of enabling technology as spoken to by both um, our keynote speaker and our lead uh, speaker, in particular information and communication technology to promote the empowerment of women. And finally, to adopt and strengthen sound policies and enforceable legislation for the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls at all levels. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, the panelists for today. And in no particular order, I have Madam Amina Oyagola, FCIOD, FCIDP, MCIPN. She's a lawyer, an independent director, a global human resource thought leader. Her career spans human resource strategy and transformation, legal consulting, banking, oil and gas, and telecommunications. Madam Amina Yagola is the founder, Women in Successful Careers, managing consultant of AKMS Consulting, and a partner in Oyagola Chambers and a Chivening Scholar. She is an alumnus of Trinity College, Cambridge University, Lancaster University, INSEAD, London Business School, IMD, and Harvard Business School. She is a fellow, former chair and advisory council member, the African Leadership Initiative West Africa, part of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. She's a member, NBA, IBA, CIPM, Women Corporate Directors, International Coaching Federation and Chartered Fellow, CIPD UK, a fellow of the Governing Council, CIOD, Certified Ethics and Officer, and fellow of the Institute of Management Consultants. Madam Amina was appointed to the Presidential Council on Support to Women and Girls by the Nigerian President in recognition of our contribution to gender equality and women empowerment. Please join me in welcoming Madam Amina Oyabola as one of our panel discussants for today. I also have the pleasure of introducing Marilyn 
or BISA or SULA, who is the head, ESG, Sustainability and Climate Change Practice of PricewaterhouseCoopers Nigeria. She has over 16 years of experience spanning business development, market entry services, UN Sustainable Development Goals Integration and Implementation for Sustainability for small enterprises and large corporates. Marilyn has led many client engagements in services such as sustainable finance, decarbonization services, sustainability and reporting, sustainability assurance impact assessments, sustainability strategy, and provided advisory services on green, blue, and circular economies. Marilyn's passionate about supporting the career growth of women in the workplace and education for both the girl and the boy child. She's committed to advocate on SDG 5 and as well as SDG 8. She's equally a mentor and a coach. Please join me in welcoming my ex-colleague and my sister, <laughs> Marilyn Obaisa Asuna. Marilyn, you're welcome. I also have the pleasure to welcome Madam Taiwo Udulege, FCIS. She's the Managing Director and CEO PAN Nigeria Limited. She graduated in 1987 with a BSc in economics uh, from the prestigious University of Illori, Paris State, um, and an MMC, M MSc in global management from the University of Salford, United Kingdom. She's a corporate governance professional and a certified charter secretary and administrator, a fellow of the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators, ICSA. Madam Taiwo has over 36 years of extensive private sector experience, cutting across banking, ICT, corporate finance, investments, banking, and economic development, having trained both in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Madam Taiwo was the CEO of NESBITT Investment Nigeria Limited until her appointment in 2020 as a managing director of Pan Nigeria Limited. Interestingly, she's the first female CEO of Pan-Nigeria in its 51 years of existence. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Madam Taiwo Oluleye. Thank you very much. I also have, you're very welcome. I also have Madam Ade Ronke Adeyinka with us today. She's the head of Youth Women Banking and First Bank Group. She holds a bachelor and master's degree in biochemistry, specializing in oncology from the University of Ibado. Adironke is a highly motivated, curious, collaborative, creative, focused, and result-oriented senior-level professional with over 19 years of hands-on leadership experience in the financial industry. She has been instrumental in identifying and resolving projects and team issues and motivating teams to work together. Adironke is reputable for providing sharp, forward-thinking analytics that bolster organizational growth and drive projects to successful completion. She is an excellent leader who manages junior team members while serving as a key resource to top business leaders and executives. Madam Aderonke is a research and knowledge junkie, uh, and this enhances her capability to deepen her desire to develop an ethical, disciplined, and synthesized mind that fuels her passion, which she in turn channels to myriad of hobbies and interests. Please join me also in welcoming Madam Aderonke um, Adeyinka to the floor. Uh, it's a pleasure to anchor uh, this uh, very important panel that we have today. And um, first and foremost, I would like to throw my first question to Madam Amina Ayagola in the excitement of the first two speakers, actually. Um, okay. It wouldn't be out of context to say that the world is recorded some level of progress over the last few years. More girls are going to school, to school now and fewer girls um, are forced into early marriage. More women are serving in parliaments and positions of leadership than we've ever had it in history. And laws are being reformed to advance gender equality. Madam Amina, when you consider these successes, and I know that you have a legal background, we also are encompassed with the many challenges that remain from discriminatory laws and social norms that remain perversive to women who continue to be underrepresented at all levels of political leadership. 
taking into consideration Sustainable Goal 5, what do you think is required in our local context here in this nation, Nigeria, to achieve the ultimate goal of ensuring that women are not left behind and they participate in economic empowerment um, and girls are fully educated. Over to you, Madam Amina. Thank you very much. First of all, let me say thank you very much for the opportunity to have been invited. Thank you, First Bank. And let me uh, permit me to stand on all existing protocols and also to recognize Madam Beatrice, if she's still on the line, uh, UN Women uh, for their partnership and all the distinguished speakers on the panel. And uh, my dear sister, um, Mo Abudu, <laughs> thank you for that really inspiring um, lead talk as well in line with the IWD um, theme, which is inspiring inclusion. You really inspired all of us this morning as usual. Yes, that's a loaded question, Dr. Atoki, and it can take all day. But also deserving. I know that you are in the best place to talk to it. So <laughs> it was deliberate. Question. A loaded question. There's uh, First of all, let us always celebrate the progress that we have made, no matter how small. So, and I think you've already acknowledged that. So we've made some progress, but there is still a lot of work to be done. And a lot of work to be done, and I'm going to segment it into two parts. I think... Uh, from the governmental point of view, I think the enabling environment needs to be created. If we are serious about moving the needle, and if you see other African countries where there's been more significant progress than I'm sad to say we are seeing here in Nigeria, you'll find that it was driven not just by the fact that there was a galvanization of a women's movement, but it was also driven by the fact that there was enabling legislation you know, to back it. So one of the key things I think is just ensuring, first of all, if there's the political will, and I'm hoping that in this administration, we're gonna see a change in that regard, is the passage of those gender bills that were rejected previously. I think that would go a long way to ensure that there's progression. And because of time, I can't go into the details. We're all very familiar with what the issues are there. Um, I also think that, you know, to expect governments to address all of these issues is not realistic, which is why the issue of gender equality needs to be attacked and addressed, you know, um, from a multifaceted uh, approach and strategy, and which is why the role of the private sector, apart from, you know, civil society, the role of private sector, uh, primarily in driving the achievement and the attainment of the SDGs um, is, is key. So um, the partnership of the private sector is key. And UN Women, you know, Madam Beatrice and her team understand that. And that is why, you know, they have worked with some of us and appointed Whisker, for example, as private sector liaison to assist in the engagement and, uh, uh, um, and forging, you know, some of that partnership. There are many ways of ad addressing this, but I think that, you know, some, 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 some things are obvious and they are simple and they're in front of us and they're available and we should just use them. And First Bank is a fantastic example. Even this convening today, I think we should all do a big shout out to First Bank for what they're doing here today. It's absolutely excellent. But First Bank beyond this convening has demonstrated as a private sector organization its leadership in embracing, first of all, doing taking the simple step of signing on to the women empowerment principles. The women empowerment principles, as we know, the UN Women has a mandate to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, SDG5. And it's an ambitious and very, very broad agenda for the world to achieve by 2030. So they created in partnership with uh, UN Global Compact, the women empowerment principles. And the UN empowerment principles is a holistic and very simple seven point framework, which the private sector companies can embrace to promote gender equality and uh, the women empowerment and women empowerment, not only in the workplace, which is important, which is under their direct control, but also in the marketplace and in the community. So WEPS um, informed by the international labor and human rights standards is grounded in the recognition that businesses have a stake in and a responsibility for gender equality and women's empowerment. WEPS is therefore a very, very powerful 
uh, platform, I think is the right word, to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and in the community for the benefit of all of us as individual human beings, but also for the benefit of the Nigerian economy and the, and the globe at large, and the benefit of society and the benefit of the organization. Uh, there's an expression that UN Women uses, which is that equality means better business. That's the bottom line. If you embrace WEPS, there are so many benefits that will accrue to your institution, not just improved performance, improved productivity, not just in, you know, expanding your markets, driving innovation, uh, em enhancing employee engagement, employee well-being. I can go on and on and on. But because of time, I, I, I will stop there. But let me also say that um, you know, what we've done so far, and I want to just share some statistics just to give us hope. And let me also say that organizations that have not yet signed up are really going to be leaving themselves behind. We're moving in the direction of ESG and diversity, equity, and inclusion is becoming more increasingly important. And more, and there is a lot more awareness now in the consumer population. The customer is really truly king. And also the employees in terms of you know, deciding in terms of the value proposition they would like to see in an organization in which they would like to work in, especially with the kind of attrition, you know, a retention is a real issue in the world of work today. So these things are going to become increasingly important in terms of they need to be in the core operations of every company for, for your own survival as, as a private sector company, for your own sustainability. So what we've done, what I, what I want to say now is that globally, um, if you sign on to the webs, you are joining a community of about 9,000 organizations that have already signed on. Leading in that, uh, in that space is really Brazil, followed by Turkey. In Africa, you know, South Africa um, is leading the pack, but Nigeria is very, very close behind. In 2021, when we were brought on board by UN Women to assist with this, there were only 34. Can you believe with the size of the Nigerian economy, economy only 34 Nigerian companies had signed on to the webs. But I'm proud to say today that we are now at a, a number of about 207 companies that have signed on to the webs. Mm -hmm. But beyond signing on to the webs, that's just the first step. And it's a simple process. And let me just put it out there now so that because many organizations think, oh, what is this? I'm sure it's some bureaucratic long process and it has a cost and so on and so forth. No, it does not. Signing on to the women empowerment principles, all you need to do is, first of all, be a registered company at the Corporate Affairs Commission. Secondly, you need to be reg registered as a for profit organization. And thirdly, you need to have a functional website. It is as simple as that. The rest, you know, is basically, you know, for you to fill out a form and for the CEO, the leader of that organization to commit, you know, to the webs and make a statement. It's as simple as that. But that's a simple part. You know, signing on for me is the simple part. The important uh, part going forward is what you do with being a signatory, apart from the benefit that will automatically accrue to you from having access to all the tools beyond the WEPS framework itself, all the global tools, which can really enhance your business end-to-end -end along your supply chain, and also access to other brands. But you know, beyond that is what actions are you taking inside your organization to embrace WEPS, to embed the principles, um, to develop a gender um, action plan, to ensure you have gender responsive budgeting, to ensure that you know um, gender equality is a, a, a top priority in, 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 in your business plan, to ensure it has been integrated into your performance management framework, to ensure that it is one of the KPIs sitting on everybody's performance agreement inside their organization. What have you done? That is what we want to see. And that is why I think, you know, what First Bank is doing really needs to be applauded. Some of what they're, they're already right. mentioned, but beyond, um, you know, setting up the First uh, Bank uh, Women's Network in which, you know, they have all kinds of programs where they have a roadmap to drive you know the gender agenda they already they also have the first gem desk which is addressing the issue of women owned and women led businesses and entrepreneurship and trying to ensure financial inclusion beyond that they also they have 
campaigns and workshops that try to address sexual harassment and um, other welfare uh, processes within West Bank. I'm not, I'm not, I haven't been, you know, tapped on the shoulder by First Bank, but honestly, you know, when you see somebody doing the right thing and doing it in the right we manner support them. and doing it with passion, you know, and with full commitment, you really must, you know, you really must, you really must applaud them. And also there's, right. you know, yeah. they have their support, uh, uh, women careers progression um, network where they also embark on on mentorship. You know, I'm passionate about mentorship, and that's what Whisker is all about. But you know, they deal with Whisker, they deal with Wimbys and other organisations. You know, in this regard. But what I'm really, really proud about is that First Bank has set targets, and that's what we need to do because what is not measured doesn't get done. They've set targets for themselves. They've said that by 2024. You know, and I'm quoting them from the last engagement I, I attended, you know, First Bank, that they want to have 40 percent, you know, representation amongst their employees. And they're already at 39 percent. So I'm sure they're going to exceed that 40 percent this year. Furthermore, yeah. leadership representation, they set a target of 40 percent and they're already at 30 percent. So you can see wow. that if, if we are serious about moving the needle. You know, it starts with intentionality. It starts with, you know, the po the political will from the leadership of an institution and a decision taken at the very top, you know, to do so. I don't know whether I've answered your question fully, uh, Dr. Morris. But oh, maybe yes, I you have more than addressed the question. I like that you narrowed in on um, web, particularly uh, the women empowerment principles and all the good works uh, that... Uh, First Bank is doing in order to ensure that uh, they meet their set target. I didn't hear you lastly talk about uh, organizations, um, deliberateness and intentionality to set targets around all this um, women empowerment achievement. Um, you cannot measure what you do not, um, you cannot uh, report what you, uh, you cannot measure what you don't report rather. So uh, uh, that, that's really uh, taking and, and thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for for those comments, um, I would I like to uh, ask one more thing, Doctor Atoki, uh, which I think <laughs> is. Why am I going to let you spend a lot of time on your question? But <laughs> okay. well, please go ahead. Please okay, go so ahead. I think one, one thing I want to mention, and UN Women is doing a lot in that regard, is this issue of affirmative procurement, because whoever plays the piper dictates the tune. Women don't have access to capital. Do you know that women have only have access to only 1% of all the procurement contracts in Nigeria? So that's another yeah. aspect of the whole women empowerment process. And that is principle five. I just want to draw attention to principle five also of WEPS. Oh, As right. I said, right. WEPS has two principles and these are very important. So that's something Excellent. we Thank you, to. thank you so much. I really do appreciate um, uh, uh, that. And uh, please, uh, Madam Oyagola, I'm still going to have another round where we, you would um, speak. So please uh, uh, bear in mind that there's that there's another opportunity to talk to you. I really need to take uh, Marilyn's uh, comments now. I understand she needs to uh, be occupied, I think, virtually on, on another uh, role. So Marilyn Obaisa Osula, uh, it's, it's now your turn. I want to talk about gender equality not being a funda not being only a fundamental human right, but a necessary foundation for a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable world. How do you see big corporates um, and you in your capacity as the head of um, sustainability and climate change in uh, a big four, Pricewaterhouse, and dealing with a lot of corporates? How do you see them ensuring that their supply chain is gender inclusive what best practices uh, should we be paying attention to and why over to you marilyn thank you very much uh dr morris uh, good to see you again we used to be good colleagues we work together very passionate about the sdg so i am not surprised she's here again um, on this call i bring you greetings from pricewater house coopers just confirm you can hear me okay I bring you yes, yes, from Prize Waterhouse Coopers, uh, PwC. Very happy to have been invited here, listening to Madame Mo. Like uh, Madame Britti said, my notes are long. I, I just kept flipping pages. Thank you so much for this. Um, thank you, First Bank and UN Women for this 
very powerful and insightful session. Happy to be, you know, part of the panelists. When I saw my name on the list of the panelists, I'm like, okay, these are fantastic women I would like to uh, listen to. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So just to give you a quick um, context in two minutes, uh, just to set that context on supply chain, just for the benefits of a few people here who may not, you know, kind of understand what we mean by supply chain. Uh, it, this refers to the process, uh, you know, all the processes, including the human networks that help us or ensure that goods and services get to the final consumer. And I've listened a lot to uh, Madame Beatrice and all the things that the UN uh, women are doing. I've also listened to Whisker and, uh, and the Web's uh, principle, which I'm very familiar with as well. And this is very, very laudable. Uh, I would then just say a quick thing about supply chains. With all this that is happening, we 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 we, uh, we yeah we celebrate our progress, but it's just amazing that only one ninety million women globally are in the global supply chain. And if you let us take a quick, let me just take a quick supply chain that will be familiar with all of us, which is the cocoa to chocolates. Almost every woman I know loves chocolates, and even if you hide under, I love dark chocolates because it's healthy. You love chocolates. All the packages of uh, our Valentine gifts, you know, there will always be something about chocolate, chocolate cakes and things like that. And interestingly, it starts from Africa, West Africa, especially. And if you look at that supply chain all the way to, to the chocolate factory, you find that, that women only play very, uh, women play only 20% 20, 20 um, economically there. And when we say economically, rewarding them and getting all the rewards, I mean, from statistics in 2015. And it's not different if you look at what the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization has also said concerning the statistics. What has happened is that women remain unseen, some of them. Some of them remain underpaid. Some of them are not even paid at all. So the service is for free. I also heard Madame Bridges talk about how women do a lot of work that is not rewarded or is not paid for. And this, of course, is of concern. Having moved to that, which is quite sad, you've heard me talk about agriculture, you've talked about, we'll talk about manufacturing services and all that. But I also did mention uh, the digital economy a lot. We find a lot of women moving into the digital economy. And of course, there's a lot of stereotype uh, in that for men being the ones to be doing things like that. But we want to encourage more women to move into that. And also the low carbon economy, where we have the blue economy, uh, we also have the circular economy, we increasingly seeing women going to recycling, and we also have uh, things like the green economy. Interestingly, women are producing alternative fuels from palm oil, from all sorts of things um, that just bringing up innovation. So women are not just participants, you know, we are job creators, we are wealth creators, but what is very critical, and before I go to the uh, practical steps, is that when we then become, go to the scaling up, which includes international trade, formalizing informal sector businesses, and also taking us away from the bottom of the pyramid into you know, the SMEs. That's where the barrier comes in for women. You find that there are men scale up faster in their businesses than women do. Uh, you find all that, but it shouldn't be. We should be inspired by the first African woman to head the World Trade Organization, which is Dr. Okonjuwala. I respect her so much. If she can make it to that World Trade Center, I think we should make advantage, take advantage of that. We should be core in the supply chain of the world. Uh, and I'm putting that challenge to African women. And I will get into practical steps to which we can make that happen. So it is very, very clear that women are important to the supply chain and important to the business. So therefore, what do we do? What are the practical steps that we'll do? I've been able to highlight five. Uh, in my notes because of time, because I know that this will not it take a lot of time. I would also encourage the UN women and also First Bank to make this topic a program on its own because there's a lot to talk about. So that will encourage trade and supply chain uh, participa participation for women. The first is the role of women in women affairs. That's how I've named it. Why? Women business leaders need to, women business leaders need to mentor other women. Very important. You, if you don't, if there's no mentorship in business, I don't see that there will be growth. I've seen that the most business that scale, they come from very good mentorship. So we need to take each other's hands and grow each other. 
very important. And I'm happy that Whisker is part of the mentoring. I know there are a couple of women organizations doing this. My word today is let's scale it up. Let's do more of that. It's very important. Many, many ladies have ideas, but they don't even know how to move from you know what Mo said to where, where where Mo started to where Mo is. So in between that, we need some level of mentorship. Secondly, quickly, I will go into the, the role of women in, in trade-related policy formulation and implementation. And I'll just speak to the African free trade agreement. I know it's now been implemented, but what I have not seen very strong in it, and of course we need to advocate for this, is what exactly is the role of gender inclusiveness in that? because we need to trade in within Africa and women need to play key roles in that supply chain. Thirdly, I'll go to the role of the public uh, private sector executives. I'm sure uh, the first speaker is going to smile when I say this in their procurement um, strategy, but she did mention that as, as the principal five of the webs when she was talking, I quickly took notes about that. Very, very important. Uh, what we are saying is what we, are, and I need to be clear about this. We're not saying that you should give procurement contracts to people because they are women. No, we are saying say part this particular contract is dedicated to women businesses. Then you professionally select from it. I don't know if that's clear. So there's that, you need to make that target. It's very, very important because it's a very good way to promote uh, women inclusiveness in your uh, supply chain. And I assure you that those women will be very grateful. And that's also a good way to scale up their businesses and also even help them access finance, which is um, the next point I want to make. That's the fourth point, and I have one more, and then I'll close. The fourth one is financial inclusion, and I'm not going to talk much about that because Madam Beatrice really broke that down into and all the investment from um, uh, non-financial aspects of investment to the financial aspect of investment. So I'm not going to talk into that. But I will just talk about things like cooperatives that we used to have and challenge banks and commercial banks. I know that First Bank is doing a lot, but I want to challenge you more to bring up gender-based financial products that will be friendly to women. And so any impact investor in the room, I've heard you talk about green financing, social financing, but which is good. But there's also that gender specific financing uh, that we need to bring on board and build frameworks to, to, uh, to do that. And we in PwC, we are hoping to support you as you think about those. Lastly is the fifth one, advocacy, partnership, and capacity building. People always say this, but I want to be specific on this point. When I say advocacy, partnership, and cap uh, uh, capacity building, I'm specific to where you should be doing this. One is finance. We've talked about financing coming to women. What we have left out is how women build their finances or the finances of their business. Women need training in such things. Sometimes a woman can give her capital and her, and her, and her profits and just take care of the entire home. And then she goes into poverty straight and then starts looking for money to start again. So, but that finance training is very important. And these are the kind of things we should advocate form partnership for and build people for. Next is technology. Madam Beatrice also spoke about that as well. We need to train now these women how to use data to build their business. So automation, decision making, and just you know access to um, technology to help them scale up businesses, which is very important. Many women don't have this expertise, and we need to be able to teach them. And then the S, the NAS is trade, trade itself, and not just trade. They all know their trade. If I make hair, I know my trade. But how do I take this trade from where it is now to where to global level? Those are the kinds of training and advocacy and partnership that we're talking about. And I'm going to call out two right. things on this. The first commission is the promotion uh, investment promotion uh, commission. We have a lot of them in Africa and also the export promotion commissions, whether in, in uh, whether as in the embassies or not, we need them to come up. We want to see your impact report, your sustainability reports. What are you doing to make sure that women have this access as we have said, thank you. And I will just end with this. Women, <laughs> we have this cultural and religious beliefs, right? So what we find that, that they use religion to kind of hide, you know, instead of using religion to break the ceiling. So as I will go with the Christian and I will speak to the Muslim before I end. The first is, look, as Christians, just go to Proverbs 31. That woman was an international trader. She was trading from her house, from her garage, having ships and all that. So I don't know why we can't break that ceiling like Mo Abudu has said. God is there for you. 
And for the women, the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace uh, and blessing be upon him, Khadija was a big business merchant. So if the Prophet can have such a wife, I see no reason why women are hiding on that religion, not, not to scale up their businesses. Thank you for your time. Right. And look forward to hearing from everyone as they scale up their business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. Uh, quite insightful uh, comments there and answers. As you see, big corporates ensuring that their supply chain um, is gender inclusive and also sharing best practices. Um, thank you very much for, for all of the remarks. I'd like to now go to Madam Taiwo Odunaye. And Madam Taiwo, I do recognize that you also wanted your question to be um, asked on time. So please bear with us. Uh, to you, Ma, how do you assess the UN uh, Women Empowerment Principles level of adoption and integration in Nigeria currently? And uh, where are the opportunities for organizations? I recall that Madam Amina attempted to um, answer some of this, but from your own perspective, where do you see um, the opportunities for organizations to integrate these principles into their business op operations and activities? Over to you, Madam. Thank you very much. Um, the women empowerment principles and how to incorporate, just a minute. Can I have the question again, please? Oh yes, uh, uh, sorry about that. It's just largely, and so think about the principles. Um, what, what, where are the opportunities for organizations that integrate these principles into their business operations and activities. So again, we've heard a lot from um, Madam Beatrice, uh, from Madam Amina, about this uh, importance of uh, being part of the women empowerment principles. What is the advantage? Why? Yeah, it's simple to get in on it. So um, what would I lose if I'm not a part of this uh, big uh, uh, um, movement? Over to you, Ma. Um. Companies uh, that don't um, permit me, sorry, to stand on all existing protocols and the earlier speakers, thank you for the insight and the interesting ideas thrown into the space. Thank you for the insightful session. The um, organizations that don't incorporate the women empowerment principles would be left out um, I, for one, um, come from a background, I operate in a background that's male-dominated. So um, we, I mean, the, uh, my company is in the engineering industry, and so we don't have many uh, females on, you know, in that profession. So um, for me, companies that don't align with the WP webs would be left out. But in my case, uh, PAN would not be left out because it's a male-dominated profession and industry, and we don't have much um, to do on, on that. Just a minute. Just a minute. Okay, would you like for me to kind of uh, tweak yes, the question to your, yes. yes okay, so what, let's consider, actually, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's justifiable to, to reassess. Um, how do you consider an organization like yours? Again, you are in a male-dominated um, organization. Um, you are uh, a lot of engineers. Uh, you work with them, and possibly you're also uh, a one. Um, how do you uh, think that this kind of organizations can better support women and involvement, um, especially at the uh, top management level? And how are they promoting you know, women to be uh, participants in all of these uh, important decision-making uh, rules. Is that is that a better? Yes. Please Thank go you. ahead, ma'am. Right. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
um, Pan Nigeria is in the business of automobile assembly. So, and we operate in a male dominated industry. So we have a few um, females. The statistics show that there are fewer women in that profession than men. So, but that notwithstanding, in we 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 still engage female engineers. We have some engineers at some point in time. We had about four on the assembly line, and we we've never been confronted with any reason for a major policy, you know, to accommodate gender-based issues because of the rigidities in our policies and our operating procedures and practices. And so, but um, the reason being that one of our uh, most, most critical elements of our value additions in, our, in the automotive industry is such that we, we place emphasis on, on quality and on safety and therefore, we try to maintain gender neutrality. You know, we, we maintain gender neutrality to achieve this goal. And also, we require, um, in our industry, we require independence across value chain activities, which minifi, minimizes inferences, you know, in advancing inclusiveness by our partners. There are actually no entry barriers to the female in in our company, for example, we're open to employing uh, females, but um, we have just a few in the engineering and more on the administrative side, you know, the sales, the marketing, the finance and other administrative roles. But we, what we've done as well is we have, we, we have, um, for PAN, we, at some point in time, PAN started to enlarge the scope of her CSR. So we established a learning center where ladies are trained, you know, in automotive engineering, mechatronics, and all the works. And at some point we had um, the first lady mechanic, engineer Aguebo, we had a, some collaborations with her on her lady mechanic initiative. So we've trained a couple of hundreds of female mechanics in that regard. And also um, we are open to further collaborations. We, 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 um, we also engage our um, stakeholders, you know, in being open to uh, recruiting females, we 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 also um, uh, because of the 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 industry in which we operate, we just maintain gender neutrality. So although we we have a few um, ladies in, of course the 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 we have more men, you know, on the line in the company but mostly we're gender neutral and, and, and uh, yeah, we're, we're gender neutral. All right, fair enough. Thank you so much um, for that uh, perspective. And, and, and even seeing you at the helm of affairs in PAN makes us to appreciate further um, the works that, uh, the intentionality behind the works uh, that are being done to ensure that women participate at top level management um, in your organization. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights with us. Uh, next and, and last but not the least, I'd like to um, ask Adiroke Adiginka. Um, Madam, by way of exemplary solutions, again, you belong to First Bank Group. What in your experience would amount to sustainable innovative financial instruments? I know that already uh, First Bank um, and again spoken by Madam Amina, you've touched points on some of the works and that First Bank is doing, but in terms of innovative financial instruments, um, what do you think, what amounts to, to that? Uh, and 
how is it required to accelerate gender equality? Having looked at what they are, where do you see challenges in developing some of these tailored financial instruments and products uh, to advance women's socioeconomic empowerment in Nigeria? Over to you, madam. All right, thank you very much, Marni. Thank you very much, Dr. Morris. <laughs> Back to um, this is Taiwo. I mean, I like the sound of that word, mechatronics. It sounds like something I want to explain. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, to your question on the on innovative financial solution. I mean, I'll start from the perspective of Romo said. She talked about um, first of all, I'll talk about what First Bank has done. I'll give you the statistics, and then I'll also talk about some of the challenges we experienced while we're rolling out uh, all of those products. So for First Bank, more than 38% of our accounts, over 38% of our account fees are owned by women. Interestingly, you know, the most times the mis misconception there is that putting women don't really own accounts, but more than 38% of the um, accounts in First Bank are owned by women. And out of those um, accounts, if you look at the um, geopolitical distribution of those accounts, you find out that in Lagos, we have 18% of those um, accounts based in Lagos. In the southeast, we have um, 17%. In the south-south, we have 21%. In the southwest, we have 16%. In the north central, we have 15%. In the northeast, we have 6%. And in the northwest, we have 8%. So this is not something that just happened overnight, but it shows a conscious effort from First Bank to ensure that we um, leverage our spread across the geographical locations in Nigeria. And then talking about the First Bank, we talked about 38% of our accounts being um, owned by women. Out of that, we have more than 70% of them being savings deposits. You know, women, we ever want to save, we save. So um, it's something we deliberately do. And then we have current accounts accounting for 9% of that. We have our fixed deposits accounting for 6% of that. And then we have domiciliary accounts as well, accounting for 14% of that. And then talking about innovative solutions, we have our agency network. We have more than 30% of women involved as agents. And you know what that means? That means we create um, employment opportunities for other women and also for children and for all of that. So those are some of the innovative solutions that we've come up with. So um, that's a lot of um, innovative work that has gone into that because the agency space is not something that is very easy. But you know that First Bank pioneered that, pioneered that I've did a lot of tweaking along the way. There were challenges here and there, but those are some of the things that we did and it really helped us. Um, also, um, you talked about innovative solutions. I'd like to talk about the First Gem Funds. The First Gem Funds is the only single digit loan targeted specifically at women in the industry as are today. So we don't give the loans to men. I mean, don't say we are gender bias, no. The focus is we know that women need to play in this space. So we didn't just give out that loan to everybody. What we did was it was specially curated. So what we did was we look at industries where women are playing, we decided to play more there. And then we also looked at industries where women are not playing very well, and we started to play there as well. So when we give out those loans, we give it to those women just to ensure that they grow their funds and then they can give out uh, more money. So what are these industries that we play in? We look at the food and beverage industry. We look at the confectionery industry, which is catering, which a lot of women do. We also look at transportation, which is majorly logistics and all of that. We also look at the beauty and cosmetic products. I mean, for the beauty and cosmetic products, we see a lot of um, a lot of that. We talked about women just giving birth and having all those challenges. But these are industries where you can play. Even if you just give birth, you can still play in all of those industries at your own pace and at your own convenience. We also have the agri and agro allied um, retail space where we play. So these are the special spaces where we play. And it's not collateralized. You don't need to have a collateral. So long as you run your account with First Bank, we give those loans to you. And like I said, it's a single digit loan, 9%. And especially in a day like today, when interest rates have gone, on, gone up on all other products, we are still maintaining 9% for that um, particular loan, the first gem funds. So how can women assess the loan? Just walk into the nearest first bank branch and be able to assess um, that loan. So it's something we tweaked over and over again. Now we have testimonials from our customers. We have them cut across all over the globe. We have... Um, we have um, Toma Pex from um, Kano that testified to say she has moved beyond the first gen funds, which is just um, which we give to women, and she has moved beyond that to higher loans so that she can grow her business. So there's so much to say, but I mean, with the space of time, these are some of the innovative solutions that we come up with. There are a lot of financial instruments, but the loans are one of those we are played in. We have a lot of other loans we have for the health sector, we have for the um, for, for, for the um, for the first traders as well, we have for the uh, pharmaceuticals as well. A lot of industries where we play. Right. So these are some of the innovative solutions we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I, I knew that you would do justice uh, to the question and thank you for sharing uh, the customized uh, financial instruments that First Bank has been able to put in place, uh, specifically for women in women empowerment. Thank you. Thank you once again um, for sharing all of those.
Now we're going to our group discussion, but again, because of time, what I will do is merge the group discussion with our final uh, one minute uh, remarks. So all of us on the panel have an opportunity to um, say one, one uh, closing remarks, give our closing remarks in one minute. But I want you to uh, wear this heart, the heart of uh, participating by sharing pointers that align policies with practices. Again, we've heard a lot of, you know, um, some across reforms and, and legal guidelines, um, some across supply chain. Considering that gender issues, we all agree, are human rights issues. Uh, what are the policy level approaches that is required to scale gender inclusion? Again, combining policies with uh, practicality. And I will start with um, Madam Amina Oyagbola. Over to you now, in one minute. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, I was a bit distracted. Could you just repeat your question? Apologies. <laughs> oh, <laughs> not a problem. Uh, so this is the, this is the final round. But yes. again, um, I want you to make it your closing remarks. Okay. And I want you to consider uh, gender issues as human rights issues, as we have all agreed. Mm -hmm. Again, you being, you know, uh, in the legal profession, but again, combining policies uh, with mm -hmm. practicality, what policy level approach is required to scale? So we all know that there are efforts, um, there are customized financial instruments, but what policy level approach is really required to amplify this, to scale, um, all of this for gender inclusion that the country currently requires. Over to you. Thank you so much. As I said uh, earlier on, I think, I believe in, you know, policy advisories, policy directives. We saw how the central bank policy, um, which was really an advisory directive, uh, which the, you know, the former uh, CBN governor uh, implemented during his time, uh, Sanusi, his, his Royal Highness Lamido Sanusi, uh, Sanusi, um, where he mandated that the, you know there should be was it 30 percent or forty percent um, representation of women in banks, and that immediately, even there was an advisory guideline translated to all the banks taking diversity and inclusion a lot more seriously. And today, because of that policy that you know that directive that was given several years ago, you know had you know, we now we now see CEOs, female CEOs emerging in financial institutions. So we need similar things across industries. I'm talking about the right. privacy to begin with. We need similar directives across industries or, or advisory guidelines, uh, or leaders, leaders of organizations and CEOs actually setting targets themselves and driving those targets. That's from the private Absolutely. sector. Angle. And at the government level, it's the political will. I think you know the gender policy is there. You know, the Child Rights Act is there. It's been domesticated in most of the states in Nigeria, but what is the level of enforcement? What is the level of implementation? Uh, again, that is down to leadership and to uh, implementation and execution. Absolutely. And, and, and finally, I would say, you know, this issue of, you know, the gender bills, the passage of the gender bills, it's very, very important that that happens. We saw with the last elections today, even though we say we have, you know, some representation in national assembly, we only have three senators representing us mm -hmm. we still have no female governor in the 36 states of the federation we are so 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 far behind so i think mr president has a lot of power he can issue executive orders in the areas you know he can he can demonstrate diversity and inclusion which he announced in his inaugural speech was a key pillar you know for this administration right. we want to see more female appointments in, in 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 government and i think you know in the C, in the private sector you know leaders leaders of the private sector the CEOs of the private sector. We need the he for she's, we need the male allies, we need male partnership. And I think I, li I like this particular platform because I can see, you know, from a lot of the comments coming through that a lot of your men are also are also here with us. And that's really, really important. We so cannot make progress without male support. So that's well, what I would say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant closing remarks. And, and maybe just to add the level to that is also to make aware to all of the women here that. The time for women is now. So women also need to be prepared. 
more men are participating, more men are, are listening, and they are looking for the right woman to put in the right position. So um, I think this is the generation that benefits the most. So women should please also uh, bear that in mind. Thank you very much, Madam Amina. I do really appreciate your closing remarks. I'd now like to go to um, Madam Aderoke Adeninka for your closing. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I align with Madam um, Ayabola. So it's, um, it has to come from the top. So it's from the leadership. It should flow from, 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 from the head down. And our advice, not because I'm from First Bank, I advise other organizations to take a cue from what First Bank is doing. We are living by those principles. It's from the very top, the management, make sure that they are fully involved in what we do. We have a first women, first bank women network that ensures that every woman is, um, is, is, is fully involved in all of this. And this helps to ensure that the culture trickles down. And like we said, the he or she is because we have this first women network that we have our men also following us. So we have um, six major pillars I'd like to talk about that. We have the career management pillar to help women to go in their career. We have the program events and uh, the networking pillar as well. We have the personal branding pillar. We have the mentoring, the coaching and the sponsorship pillar. We have the support and welfare pillar as well. And then we have the financial planning and empowerment pillar. So all of these are things that put from the top and ensure that the culture of um, having uh, inclusion, women inclusion in the workplace is ingrained in everyone. Thank you, Dr. Maris. All right, thank you so much, um, Madam Aderonke Adenika for that closing remarks. I'd not like to go to Madam Taiwo Oduleye. Um, so, but just before her, is Marilyn still in the house? I don't see her. No, okay, Madam Taiwo, over to you, Ma. All right, thank you. Um, in terms of the government, um, you know, collaboration towards closing the gender gap, um, we appreciate all the efforts of the financial services providers, the deposit money banks, the fintechs, and others to close the gaps. But the products on offer, I, I believe, you know, on the, the various um, gender sensitive um, products that are on offer by the various banks have not actually, you know, aligned with the needs of women. So in, in, in the light of that, I would like to advocate, you know, on a bigger picture to address the gender financing challenge in the short and uh, medium to long run that um, the federal government take on a bold initiative, you know, and then using this platform by First Bank to lay a foundation for a gender-based national fund or a bank, you know, for women, targeted, you know, to women only, you know. Um, Audacious. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> so, and, you know, just women and other vulnerable groups We've had successes, but they are, to me, they are just ad hoc. But right. if the government is able to collaborate, you know, with other uh, stakeholders, um, NGOs, private sector, we, we can do this. And then these funds or banks will be targeted to women. And we already have the manpower, the, 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 the staffing on the various banks can be pulled in for manpower who are already uh, working on these uh, various product offerings like uh, Ms. Aderunke, I believe on the first gem. And um, we also have the data available already. We can pull that from the NIN, the BVN, even data from the telecommunications. And then um, and this will enable the federal government have a stronger commitment rather than have right. it all over. So, and then I'll just, just a word to women, like Miss Abudu said, um, you need to invest in yourself, invest in yourself and do it afraid, be ready to leave your comfort zone. That's how I got to be in Kaduna, in, in where Pan is based. I had to leave my comfort wow. zone to break the ceiling you know, uh, by being, you know, as the CEO of that. So I'd like to say women should be resilient as well and just uh, do it afraid. Thank you. 
read afraid. I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Madam Taiwo, for your closing remarks. What a, an insightful uh, uh, panel discussion this has been and an excellent session uh, in totality. Uh, I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Ms. Mo Abudu, our lead speaker, Ms. Beatrice Ayong, and all our discussants, uh, Ms. Taiwo Odule, Ms. Marilena Barisa uh, Osula, Ms. Amina Ayagola, and Madam Madin Rokia Dinka. I'd also like to say a big thank you to all our participants. I see over 700 people um, still in the uh, audience um, following this discussion. I must admit that this has been a really deep conversation. Investing in women is a catalyst for accelerating progress in various spheres. We must invest in women, whether through funding, through advocacy, mentorship, policy reforms, and we must be deliberate and intentional about doing so. It is unlikely to come to us if we don't demand for it. I hope you have um, sent in your comments and your chats to the chat room. Uh, we will be, uh, I, I don't know whether in the interest of time, we can even still uh, take those questions. Um, but again, uh, I would like to call on Ms. Patient Ekeoba, the National Programming Officer, Coordinating and Partnerships, uh, UN Women, uh, to please introduce Mr. Chukwu Emeka. Mm -hmm. Uh, we will be giving the closing remarks. Uh, got seen. I hope I got that um, uh, cue correctly. Please correct me if I did not. Thank you very much. This is Patience Zekioba from UN Women. Um, it's been a very robust conversation. I also want to lend my voice in thanking all of our keynote speakers, uh, discuss and panel members has been really, really enriching. Uh, myself and Chukwemeka will be doing the quick wrap up, uh, just a reminder on some of the critical things that we've heard today. And after that, I'll just be thanking uh, some of the people who were who made this um, event today possible. So over to you, Chukwemeka, very quickly. Thank, Thank you very much, um, um I would also be Big action point from all the speakers today for Ms. Abdi. Um, the summary of action points uh, focus on the investment in personal development and how women can leverage opportunities that present themselves uh, while remaining resilient in the face of challenges. Uh, for the country representative for UN Women, her uh, major points focus on the investments with a gender lens, uh, with priority on investment in the care economy. Uh, with the example of investments in universal child care services, and also the need for all of us collaboratively to push for the gender and equal opportunity bill. Uh, for Mrs. Ayobola, uh, her summary and her focus was on collaborative engagement, especially by the private sector, uh, to use the women's empowerment principles as an entry point to their commitments for gender equality, and the empowerment of women in Nigeria. She also, also advocated for the need for gender responsive supply chains as a means for investing in women and empowering, especially women-owned businesses. For Ms. Merlin, uh, her focus was on the scale up of women businesses. And she ad admonished that we could do that through one, mentorship by women, women's participation in trade, um, intentionality by the private sector in engendering the supply chains, the need for financial inclusion, advocacy, partnership, and capacity building while leveraging on technology. For Ms. Taiwo, um, she also spoke on um, how in spaces where men are dominant, um, private sector as well as other organizations can address this gender neutrality uh, by taking intentional steps to not only encourage women, but um, also provide the enabling environments and policies and tools that will make women thrive in those spaces. A more key point, which I think is very interesting, has been her advocacy for a gender-based national form where women can draw from to ensure that they empower themselves. And then lastly, for Ms. Adoronke, um, her, her positions focused on financial inclusion uh, with instruments and mechanisms that fit, and which is very critical, the needs of women. And as we know, the needs of women are not homogeneous. 
um, and this was being achieved by First Bank using this agency-based uh, methodology. Um, additionally, um, another key way of ensuring financial inclusion from her position is also target industries where women are, where women dominate, uh, use that as a strategy, and also um, ensuring that for ensuring access to credit, we can focus on single digits as well as non collateralized credits. That's all for me, and over to you, Patient. Thank, Thank you very much, Thank Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, Please permit me once again to quickly just thank the leadership of First Bank and UN Women for providing the overall guidance and oversight for us to plan this event. Uh, you will agree with me that it's been a very enriching morning. I also want to quickly thank the keynote speaker, uh, just like uh, the MC said, she's taking us through her life and how she has been able to navigate all the tough places. And today she's a shining star for all of us. Uh, I want to thank my boss, Ms. Beatrice A. Young for the experts and overarching global perspective that she has provided. I want to thank Madam Amina Oyagbola. In fact, the four of them who spoke, Madam Adiron Ke, Madam Marilyn Osula, Madam Taiwo for their very illuminating um, uh, perspectives that they have shared. I think it's also in place to thank our erudite moderator, Dr. Morris, it's good to see you again. I think we saw in Benin the last time. Thank you for staring this session so well. We really appreciate. I want to thank every participant. I saw participants from Nigeria, from UK, US, and other countries who joined this particular meeting today. Thank you, everyone. Your questions, your comments, your applause, your accolades, all added to the beauty of today's session. I also want to thank the First Bank and UN Women technical team who planned this. My first thanks go to my brother Ismail uh, um, and his team for what they have done. Uh, I also want to thank my team members from UN Women, the Women Economic Empowerment Team, Communication, and everyone who made this webinar possible. Um, my last word will say that will be that we're making progress. We're not where we are. Gender equality and women's empowerment. We have moved and we are moving, and the 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 future looks really really bright. And we need to continue to collaborate. We need to continue to partner to ensure that we're able to bring to scale some of the actions we're making. And lastly, to say that we can make the world in the image that we want it, and we can make women actually take the lead in public and private spheres by the way that we invest. Not just money this time around, but everything we put into it. So thank you very much. And we look forward to another enriching webinar as the as the year progresses. Thank you and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all. Uh, again, my name is Maurice Atoki. I'm the CEO for ABC Health. And the anchor for this event has been a huge pleasure for me to moderate the panel and anchor uh, this very prestigious First Bank um, UN Women partnered uh, webinar. Thank you for being wonderful participants. Do enjoy the rest of your week ahead. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Using the wrong tools can cost more harm than good. Same applies to business. Ask yourself, 
what does your business really need? Not sure? Visit www.smeconnect.freshbanknigeria.com to find out and get the best solutions for your business. First, First Bank. Brother Chumbul, why you they fumble? If you no need to, they suffer to send money, oh. Careful, make you down the number. Eight, nine, four. Star 894 hash to get started. You first, first man. In 1894, our first branch opened in Lagos, Nigeria. And we took our place in this new land, brimming with possibilities and surprises. Take Kano, for instance, where the city's wealthiest trader made his first deposit. 20 bags of silver arriving on Camel Bank. Aren't you glad that we offer online banking today? Expanding across the West African subregion and beyond, our early presence made it possible for all hardworking Africans to build great things. So is it any wonder that not one, but two first bankers have gone on to become Nigeria's central banker? We are intricately woven into the fabric of society, supporting Polo for over 100 years and pushing the limits of athletic performance. Rooted in tradition, but constantly leaning forward into the future. Are you coming? You first, first bang. Emergencies happen when you least expect them to. It gets worse when you are cash trapped. No need to despair. First Advance has you covered. You can get that urgent cash right now on First Advance. With First Advance, salary earners can get up to 50% of their salary. No hassles. As long as you earn a monthly salary and your salary account has been active for at least two months, just dial star 894 star 11 hash or simply dial star 894 hash on your mobile phone. What's more, when you open a First Bank salary account, you can enjoy zero charges and free debit card issuance. Download the First Mobile app on Play Store or App Store today. Log in to experience First Bank digital banking. Select Loans, select First Advance and follow the prompts to receive your loan. Don't let that urgent need get the best of you. Get First Advance now. It's as simple as dialing star 894 star 11 hash. First Advance. Fast, convenient, secure. You first. First Bank. Shopping can be so much fun. Scanning through well-known brands and clicking on the pain and button is so fulfilling. Thinking of places to rock them, the island or on a boat cruise. Traveling round the world, visiting exotic places with no cash worries or border issues. The First Bank Naira credit card is accepted in over 29 million locations and can be used in over 1.8 million ATMs in over 200 countries worldwide. The First Bank Naira credit card is denominated in Naira with a maximum credit limit of 3 million Naira. It's got flexible repayment options, interest-free period of up to 45 days and highly secured with verified by Visa VBV. The card can be obtained at any First Bank branch and used for international and local payments. So, don't let cash hinder your lifestyle. Get the First Bank Naira credit card today. You first.
First Bank. Technology has changed the way we communicate. Imagine if you could chat with your bank on the go and enjoy round-the-clock services every day. Making your banking experience much more exciting, safe and convenient is exactly what First Bank WhatsApp chat banking is designed to do. Meet Alex. Whether it's 12 midnight or 5 a.m., he can make inquiries, transfer funds, buy airtime and data, pay bills, check account balance, and enjoy other banking services. From the comfort of his home, office, on a bus, in a taxi, while shopping, no matter where he is, as long as his WhatsApp number is the same as the registered phone number on his first bank account, banking is now truly at his fingertips. Be like Alex. Sign up to First Bank Chat Banking on WhatsApp today by adding First Bank on 0812 4000 to your contact list. Get on WhatsApp and say hi. Welcome to a world of possibilities. Add First Bank on 0812 4000 to begin chat banking today. You first. First Bank.